Welcome everyone to another episode of the Wood from the Trees podcast. Uh, I hope you're all keeping well wherever you're watching or listening in the world. Uh, if you're liking what we're doing and you want to support the podcast, if you go to patreon.com forward slash the wood from the trees. I'm not going to say podcast <laughs> at the end of it. And for the price of a pint, you can help us grow and support the podcast. Uh, really love what we're doing, but we don't have a network behind us and we don't have sponsors. So, you know, for the price of that little pint or uh, one of those fancy venties, you can get uh, extra episodes uncensored. You won't see it anywhere else. You can get involved in the show and you can take part in it and there's prizes to be won. So I appreciate the absolute fucky. Enjoy the episode. <laughs> Yeah, okay. No, I'm well, so bad. I, I take up my laptop. I have a MacBook uh, Pro. I bring that. That thing is just bulletproof. It goes in my top box on the bike. And do you know, have you ever been to Australia anywhere? No. Have you ever seen a washboard? Washboard? It's like on the dirt roads, the washboard is um, little ridges that are about that far apart. And it usually happens from accelerating or braking. And the road basically, if all these tiny ridges. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's horrible, but on the motorbike, if you're going slow, everything just vibrates and rattles. But when you're going slow on the motorbike, slow, but I tend to do about 100, 120k. Um, Even on rough roads? Oh, God, yeah, flat out. I go slow on tarmac and then on the dirt, just pin it. Because it's the, it's the rush as well. And I can just keep this a bit closer to you. Yeah, okay. big black cock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, Anyway, what was he saying? Ian, thanks for coming. <laughs> all right. All the way from Wexford. All the way from Gory. Gory. Yeah. You didn't see my Citroen anywhere, did you? <laughs> seen it inside of a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I'll tell you where it's not. It's not in my fucking yard. What is it, Citroen? Not? I bought a Citroen off uh, Crowden Wexford and it broke down and it's gone eight weeks now. Yeah, right. Yeah, and they can't fix it. Oh, I saw you broke, yeah, the missus broke down. The right? missus yeah. broke down, but you know, it nearly serves her right because she was the one that bought it. Hey, from a big family. Um, father, brother, and two sisters. Not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. Uh, in a town, country, two k outside Gory. What do you you would call the country? But still two kilometers from town. So yeah, very easy to get in and out. Go to school. You know all the things. It was just easy. Did you like school? Um, primary school was fine. I'd rather be outside playing soccer or football out in the. With the lads playing around, but yeah, it was okay. Secondary? Secondary was all right too. I I got chipped off. Me and my dad didn't really get on and I ended up in uh, Kilkenny College boarding school. Oh. Packed up, sent away, uh, did my three years and then I, I said to say, I had said to my dad in second year, I said, I'm... Not liking this. Well, I said, I'm, I'm going to leave. And he said that you can, after third year, you can leave, so... I went into the principal, I'll never forget it. And I went in and I told, um, I said, yeah, I won't be back next year. And he goes, that's grand. He never asked my dad. Just like nah. that? Yeah, he didn't even call home, he just said, grand. So I didn't even tell my dad for about a month. And about six weeks before I was meant to go back to, to school, I said to my dad, Jesus, uh, I may get a place there in Gory Community School, the local school. <laughs> and he goes, what? <laughs> So we went in, and because I'd been in primary school in, uh, in Gory, right in town, I managed to get a place because it was one of the biggest schools in Ireland at the time. There's now three um, secondary schools in Gory. But anyway, yeah, I managed to get in there, did my leaving cert there, and uh, it was okay. What, did, what subjects did you like in school? What were you into? Ah, sure, you know, uh, construction, engineering, ag science, and I did geography, which was grand. I always liked geography, but I didn't put any effort into it. Mm. And then like maths, Irish and English, I just, fuck it, no. Maths, I didn't do my work. Irish, I, it was just, I had a teacher allocate to me, but she, she was on maternity leave for the two years I was there and just had substitutes. So Irish was atrocious. I would, I passed. Fair play to you. I didn't. <laughs> and my maths, I passed everything. I did all right considering I didn't put any effort in, but... I just got away with murder. I could sleep in geography, Irish, and, and I never did my maths homework and the teacher never even asked. And uh, Were you chilled? In I, was, I was, yeah, I was chilled. Yeah. 
yeah, I was working, I started working when I was 16 for an electrician and my cousin. Um, doing your time? I was going to do my, I, I, when I left school, that was, well, I'll tell you, I'll back up. My dad wanted me to go to, to uh, college because he never had that sort of um, Education. chance. Yeah, mm. he, you know, he didn't, different, he's, my dad's quite, he's 77 now, but he pushed all of us to go to, to uni or college and like, fuck it. I, I didn't want to go, but I filled out my CAO and I put down mechanical engineering, I think in Carlo or somewhere. And in the end I was, uh, I deferred it. I panicked. I was like, no fucking way. Not for me. The best thing I ever did. It was in Waterford actually. It was the best thing I ever did. Um, but then anyway, I, I went to do my time and found out I was partially colorblind. That's not good when you're an electrician, I hear. No, no. <laughs> Red wire, blue wire. Right? <laughs> but, you know, the funny thing is I can see all the colors. You, you could test me now, but if there's very poor lighting and uh, there's like small colors very close to each other, I would struggle. Really? Unless you, you took a torch. So you didn't know until there was a test or something? I think way back when um, in primary school, I think I was tested and my mother would have known. But, um, you know, she'd passed away. So I didn't, um, I just didn't really remember. I just, it was just a thing that. She passed away when you were young? Yeah, 10. Oh, Jesus, that was tough. Yeah. Yeah, tough. Fuck. Tough. So tougher, you know, it's very tough for me, but I have a sister who was, she was six. Even tougher for her. Could imagine. Yeah. Fuck. And um, so there was just, uh, you, your father reared you all then? Yeah, and dragged us up. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey. we, we'd be always told we're all dragged up. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing in Ireland. But. No, my mother, my mother got cancer, um, got diagnosed on uh, Paddy's Day, 98, and died by the 4th of December that year. Fuck. Yeah, it was very quick, but... Um, can you remember that? Like, is that, like, can you oh, remember yeah. that whole process? Y yeah, I can. But uh, again, we weren't really told what was going on. And I wish someone would have said that she was yeah. uh, gonna, you know, it was terminal or whatever. We just... You know, people, people didn't communicate with kids properly no, back then. No, no. They thought, no, keep it, yeah, don't tell them to the last minute. I think it was worse. But uh, my mother would have, she was a stay at home man, but she, I'm from a farm, but she would have done like yard work day and night or morning and night. We would have done a lot of work, me and my brother as well. We, you know, I think. Parents back then would have had children pretty quickly mm. so that they'd uh, had a bit of free slave labor. Yeah. Know? But she looked after us. She did everything. And then uh, she was just, just gone. Fuck. And uh, my dad did not cook, did not do fucking nothing, paperwork for the farm or anything. But neighbors were good. People helped. And um, yeah, it got going. Got going. And now he's, yeah, everything's going well. And he's, he's a good cook and he can, huh. he can do a lot for himself. Yeah. 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 So I'd say you had to learn how to do a lot of things for yourselves as well. Oh God, yeah. I was sure, I was pretty much independent from 12, 12 on. Um, just, you could, um, I could wash, cook, do whatever I needed to do. I bet you everyone that you were in school with then, there was some, I think that if that happens to you when you're young, you're living an adult life as a child and yeah. people don't understand what kind of a life you're living when you go home. Yeah. You're, you're in a different world. Yeah. And I w it wasn't easy either because like my dad wouldn't have had much money either. And I never asked him for anything. Um, even though it was things that, you know. He needed. He needed, yeah. But again, I started working when I was 16 and then I, I became financially independent. So never, ever had to ask for money since, which has been good. Was it, did, you, did you stay working as an electrician or did you move to something else? Well, I... I did that, even when I found out, I did another year or so. This is after school, obviously. Mm. Once I left school, I did that. It was a summer job, weekend job when I was in school. I was always working. But then I, what did I do? I said, I f I said I'd uh, move on from it because I learned enough that I can, you know, wire a house. So yeah, I'm, make a few pounds. Well, do enough for myself, you know do a few bits, um, kind of forgetting how to do a lot now because you haven't used it in a long time. Mm. But then I went on the sites and I was driving excavators and doing groundwork and just trying to learn a few other things, better money. Did that for, for a year or two. And I went to New Zealand in 2009. So I play rugby, I used to play rugby. 
That's right, that's right. Yeah. So easy. Me. Yeah. When I met him on the stairs, I was like, fuck, he's a big cunt. Yeah. <laughs> I was there thinking, this lad doesn't look as big on the phone as he does in real life. But, um, yeah, I went out to play rugby. Um, it was a pretty big big decision. I hadn't really done any travelling up until then. You must have been handy at the rugby. Yeah, I was. And again, I wish I, if I would have started sooner, I only started when I went to Kilkenny College. I was 13 or whatever. Whereas my friends were playing when they were, you know, six, seven, eight, and they were better than me, but I soon caught up and I was a good player, but went to, I went to New Zealand, a friend had done it. Was that your first time out of the country? No, not first time out of the country, but I went by myself, I flew by myself and then I met, so I'll I'll back up, basically, I, I just wanted, um, a friend had went out the year before and he had done what I wanted to do this year or whatever, or that year. And there was a coach, a Kiwi coach, coach in, in Gory Rugby Club, and he was heading back out to take up a senior job in a, in a club in Matamata. It's in the Hamilton or the Waikato. And I asked him, I said, hey, can I come out? Or is anything out there? And he goes, yeah, there's under 20s. It was under 19s. And I was just turned 20, but there was some rule. You could bring back one player um, over age to play 19. So I was going to do that. And uh, another guy... Sean, another guy from Gory Rugby Club, he was 17 at the time, he came out. And this guy was, he was a bit rough and ready from the town. He was loose like, and he loved to drink. And uh, so he came out as well. And there was another guy from Dublin came out, Dean. He was uh, from sort of under, or from underprivileged area. He had, he'd won some sort of a... Scholarship. Sc- yeah, mm. to come out. Another wild lad. So the three of us were out there. And you... Yeah, in the country, lad, in Kauai. Oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we were playing uh, playing rugby, having the right old time out there. But I ended up playing seniors, and I was just twenty. But I was playing with some of these big boys and lots of Samoan, Tongan guys. You know the Islanders. Hmm. And um, one of the guys I was playing with was one hundred forty five kilos, like, and I had to lift this lad in the lineup. And I was only, I was sick before I went to New Zealand, and I was seventy four kilos, and I came back ninety two. Fuck off. Yeah. I just, and I came back and everything. Bulking up or just eating? Both. Eating and rugby, but I was in good shape. I came back and everyone's like, what happened to you? (laughs) Yeah, it was just pure rugby. I went to the gym for two weeks and then I just stopped. Just all by playing? Yeah. Hard on the body? I was young. Um, I hurt hurt my knee and my ankle and I just strapped it up and kept going. And I kept the, the local, I was playing seven flanker at the time and I kept... One of the really good players out of the, out of the team out there. Yes, yeah, so I had an unbelievable year. I played against um, Sidvini Sivatu. Was a he's a Fiji, or not Fijian? He's a Kiwi. He's, he's Fijian, but he plays for the All Blacks, and he was coming back from injury. And in New Zealand, the, those players get to play for their local clubs uh, when they're coming back from injury. And he was like a try scoring machine, but. The day we were playing him, the pitch was just like, it was like out in the bog. And so, he, he couldn't run, he couldn't step. And uh, we won, I actually won the game, but I, I smashed him a couple of times and made it in the front paper of the New Zealand Herald or something. So I have this cool picture at home. That's really cool. Yeah, that was very cool. And did you come home as the hot new guy to no. play rugby? No, no, no. I, I, I look, or were you burnt out when you came home? No, no, no. Jeez, no. I played half a season in Ireland before I went and I was super fit and I got there and I ran circles around the boys because it was their pre-season and that's how I kind of, the coach like, just come on, play seniors. But um, I picked up a dirty uh, Maori, sort of a Maori accent, like, oh, you boo, what's, that? Well, what's happening, cuz? And uh, I came home and everyone's like, would you just talk properly, like? So where I was living was um, a very Maori orientated place in the club. There was two clubs in town and one was uh, Mada Mada and the other one was Hinuera. And Hinuera was a bit more white, like, this, what, yeah. Mm. yeah. But I was playing in Mada Mada, it was sort of 50-50 and the Maori boys and the Islanders were some crack. Yeah, just. Do you pick up accents quick? No, that was the only time. Just when you were young, yeah. I suppose. And now, like, I don't even have a strong Wexford accent, I would say. It's quite neutral because I've been traveling so much, you have to try and... Um, People don't understand you if you have an accent. Yeah, they don't. You Whereas, have to flatten. If you heard me now talking to my brother, you probably wouldn't understand a word I'd be saying. We just we just run each word into the next one and 
yeah, it's pretty bad. But then, I don't know. I'll try and make a good effort tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing a good job. But you're thinking, this, this lad's very well spoken. And he's big. I better be careful. <laughs> James Bond shit. <laughs> 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 and with, were you into bikes and stuff when you were younger? Or cars? No. no. Um, cars, yeah. So me and my brother always had cars and Jeeps for the field. And sure, we started driving like, my dad would have put us up in the tractor probably age four, put in gear. You know, you might be spreading dung down the field somewhere and he'd want to bring down a tractor or two and he'd just put you in the tractor, put, it, put it in gear and he'd tell you, just go there. Yeah. And then you just drive and you might pull out the stopper or you, he'd just jump up and stop. He'd normally jump up and stop. Mm. But then by about seven or eight, we'd be driving full time. Like mm. we'd be spreading the dung and doing all the little jobs that needed to be done. But... I always was intrigued by motorcycles, but sure, I never had money. And when, my, when I was young, like, well, my mom would never let. And my dad as well, he wasn't too happy. But I got a motorbike. I, mo I moved to Australia in um, 2011. And January 12th, yeah, I bought a motorcycle in Australia. On a whim? Bit of a whim. I just did a month in the mines. Um, and I made, geez, I made $14,000 in a month. In a month? Yeah. In a month. 14, three or 14. I was unbelievable. Driving? I was driving a skid steer excavator. I was doing, it was a trench in like civil works in the mines. So uh, it was alongside a railway for Rio Tinto or something. And it was with an Irish company. Hold on, no, I'm a bit of a perv on this kind of thing. Yeah. So a skid steer is? A bobcat. And that was in the mine? Or on a rail in the mines? Or what, no, what? no, no. So this is like, you, you say in the mines, but it'd be civil work around the mines. So this was for... Um, <coughs> Tracks leading to the... Well, no, actually, sorry. I'm, I'm getting two jobs. I was on another job uh, later that year. But this one was putting in a, sort of a, a meter diameter water pipe alongside. I think it was very close to the railway. And we had a trencher. The ground was quite hard. So they actually had a trencher going along and... I was on a cat skid steer and the skid steer was half an inch each side of the tracks when they did drop it down into the trench. Then a digger would throw in bedding or, you know, that pebble. Um, mm. and then I would just run up and down the trench and get it trimmed off nice and do to, to a laser level. And then it'd be good for your pipe. And 14 like, grand. Yeah. Yeah. It was just nuts. Money in the mines is nuts. Like I did another six or seven months up there and... I kind of went to Australia, well that's another story, but I didn't plan on, I don't know, well let me back up, actually I did, well, I planned to go to Australia and make a fortune and go home and just buy a house or build a house like that, hmm. just done, and then I got there and then I, I got a job, I'm backing up, I'm going all over the place. You can go wherever you want, <laughs> there's no fucking difference. <laughs> so I got to Australia, uh, no let's go back to this mining part. Yeah, go back to mine. Um, look, yeah, 14 grand, handy out. It was for an Irish company, a bunch of cowboys. And I said it, and I say it as well to any Irish lad going out there, do not work for Irish out in Australia. <laughs> go Please, work, go, and, idea. go and work for the Aussies. The Irish will work you to the bone, like you're at home and there's no need for it. Uh, because you'd be working in crews, there could be like two Irish crews and two or three Aussie crews. The Irish will do twice the work and get paid less. And the Aussies will uh, they'll drag it on a bit. But you'd be getting paid better. And uh, I've seen, I've worked for a few Irish companies. I don't like to say that. You know, it doesn't sound good, but. It is what it is. It is what it is, yeah. yeah. But I enjoyed it. And especially when you see your bank account growing as fast as it did. So, did, it, did it, were you good with money? Like, did it burn I, a whole, well, you no, bought no. more bikes, so. <laughs> though. No, I, yeah, I would be good with money. All my friends were fucking useless in Australia. Just, you know, the, the Australian dream, drinking. But you went out knowing the value of it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like the motorbike was an investment in a way. I'll tell you what I was going to do when you asked me about the bike. I was going to do a skydiving course or buy the motorbike. It was five grand each. It was like five grand for the bike and five for the... And I was just teetering there. I didn't know which way to go. And I thought I'd have more enjoyment out of the bike realistically. Why skydiving? I was looking to feel alive. I wanted to feel alive. Yeah. Did you feel not alive? No. No, I, was, I wasn't in a good spot. Were you depressed back then, looking back now? Oh God, yeah. I was, I was in a fucking hole. For years? No. Or for just out there? 
Um, yeah. Loneliness. Well, no, I'm going to have to... In uh, October 2010, um, my girlfriend um, got killed in hit and run. No way. Jeez, yeah. I'm sorry to hear so, that. So look, um, I hung around for six months in Ireland and, you know, life was just shit. Everywhere you went, you saw sort of mem reminders. memories and reminders. And I packed up and I said, like, fuck that. Go to Australia, you know. Er and new, went, new start. And something like that. Just, I sure I was going mad on the drink, you know. But I went to Australia and a cousin of mine, the guy that, I was going to do my uh, apprenticeship with. He was in Asia for three months and he, um, I was going to meet him in Perth. We're going to buy a car, do the, you know, the big drive across to Sydney and get a job and see what happens. That was the plan. He got there three weeks before me and he never told me. I, I arrived in ready to buy a car with him and head on. And he already had a company van, good job. And he was in a house. With, he was staying where he was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which was grand actually. And he was in a house, the shittiest house in Mount, was it Mount, no, I can't think of the, Mount Morley, Mount Morley. Anyway, there was a two bed, there was three lads in each room, and there was three of us in the front room. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I am not loving this. This uh, isn't what I'm vibing here. No, this is, this is like, this, look, you never did the Australian thing, did you? No, no, no. I did a few places and I know that feeling when you arrive to a different country, you don't know anyone and you're there. This is a horrible, I can't live like this. Yeah. Well, look, I knew two of the other boys. Um, they're the they're same age as my brother, good friends with my brother. And then there was another two or three lads and a girl. Like it was a girl in with two of the boys in another bedroom from my expert. Like, and that's what happens. You just, you land into Australia and you're it's you just if you know someone you're alright. You get you have two weeks sort of leeway on their couch or somewhere. Try and get your feet, get your tax file number, get a job. Didn't try find a house, whatever. Um, and when we got a house, the same thing happened. I think I, I actually wrote down. I think like forty or fifty people came to our house oh. at a later stage. But anyway, I arrive out. This fucker has a job, and I'm like right. And uh, it was a long weekend. I think it was Australia Day or something. So we went on, we were drinking and having the crack and it was wild now. The boys were wild. They just finished their four or five years of, of college or university, mostly engineers. And I got on uh, Gumtree, it's like their done deal. And I found, um, I wrote to a couple of companies. It was coming up to seeding time in Australia and there's a, there's a massive wheat belt around Perth. And uh, I had a job within a day and I said I'd start the next Wednesday or something. So that's what I did. I went out for three months. And it was the best thing because I went out to a farm and it was meant to be in the middle of nowhere, but there was a fucking pub like 10 minutes oh, from it. Shit. I mean, it was in the middle of nowhere because I didn't want to be drinking and I just wanted to try and get my head back on my shoulders yeah. a bit. And I really enjoyed it, but it was just a distraction, you know, that's all it was. But I really, really enjoyed it. Did my seeding. We did lots of fencing and, and uh, I don't know. I did lots of things, a bit of sheep work, a bit of cattle work, a bit of fabricating, a bit of everything. And I got on well with the, with the farmers, which they were a bit odd now. And I actually went back to them there in, on this last trip in Australia and did the, the harvest for them this time. But um, so anyway, I did that for three months. Two more of my friends flew out and another friend, Sean, the guy that's, he's like my best friend now, but he's the lad that was in New Zealand and he was wild. He was wild. I had to try and look after him and he survived, I don't know how he survived New Zealand. <laughs> and, and in Australia, like I ended up, he, he was in our house for a while. I, I ended up kicking him out. Like, I kicked him out of the house. <laughs> he needed it. Like he needed a Sean, wake you're up. a lunatic. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to say this to you. <laughs> no, but like, I wasn't even, ah, he was, oh, I'm not going to go into it. But look, um, I went, we went back to Perth and we went on the beard. Two boys arrived in from Ireland and he came up from another farm in, in, Perth, in Western Australia. And uh, we went on the beard for a solid week. And I spent, like now I had nearly 20 grand in my account when I went to Perth um, from the farm. And my, I, my account had never looked so well. Like the money was, she you couldn't spend it on mm. anything. And geez, I must have spent eight or nine grand in, in the week. Fuck. And I was like, oh God, what have I done? 
I was like, and I just I called up the farm again. I said, lads, can I come back out there for a bit? So I went out for six weeks and I topped it up a bit and I came back and I had a, I bought a Camry and got going. And then I the rest of my friends came out. All my friends except one eventually in two years came out. And we were all living in a house and I worked civils in the you nearly bought brought gory with you. Ah, sure, look, look at at the time everyone was heading out there. Yeah. You know. But um we had a house and again it was wild, but just learning, After, just learning. Just when you got it? Yeah, I just didn't care. I just, well, I was, I was careful, like, but did that. And um, got my, got my license or my learners, whatever it is. And I could only get a 250. So I bought a Kawasaki 250 Ninja. Lovely little bike. And I washed it once or twice a week. It was shining. I ended up selling the car to one of my friends. I just didn't need it. I rode the bike everywhere. I loved it. And, and in Australia, it's quite flat. And the roads are just straight. It's very hard to find a good curvy road. But there's one road in Perth. Um, and there's a few roads south. So I literally got on Google Maps. Looking for bendy I roads. I was just looking for roads, yeah. And there's not many. So I found those and I did that. And I, then I knew there was something missing. I was like trying to drive off-road, but this is only a street bike. You know, I started driving through the woods and doing things and it just wasn't right. So I knew there was something missing. But... What pulled me out of the depression is like, you need to find like a passion or something that you, that you can concentrate or focus on or, um, that drives you like, and the, so the bike pulled me out, it gave me a new lease of life. But at the very same time, I remember this is where the travel aspect, the motorcycle and travel came together. I saw this video on YouTube and like, this is 2012, YouTube wasn't that big. And there was this Pol two Polish guys rode from Poland to Mongolia. And they, um, they had a shitty, like maybe the first GoPro, I don't know, it was all pixelated. But the video, man, the scenery and the, the, the vastness of Mongolia and the adventure, it just, I just knew. I just knew when I saw it, that's it. That's what I'm doing. And I was totally green. I only had a bike a year. No off-road experience. So... It came around to 2013. I got my full license about a month before I left Australia. And I had a, I had a gig that I could get sponsorship with another Irish company up in the mines. And I, I was working up there six, seven months, made lots of money. And I had the chance to go sponsorship or go home. And I couldn't just go home and, you know, go back to the sites or whatever. So I, well, well actually I'm going to back up a bit. While I was in Australia, I had met this girl. This is uh, 2012 and... We were sort of dating a bit mm. and she asked me, did I ever do any scuba diving? And I said, uh, no, never tried it. Never knew anyone that did. And she goes, would you do it? I said, yes, yeah, I'd have a go. So I got my ticket. We stopped seeing each other. And there was a guy I went to school with in Gory who was a friend of a friend. I didn't really know him that well. And he was living in Perth. So he had a motorcycle and now we both had our diving tickets. So I used to go diving. We did a few crazy and stupid things, diving, like going diving in this, this one river at night for shrimp. You, you use a torch to lamp them. And lamp and shrimp? Yeah. <laughs> I heard a lamp and deer. And <laughs> so explain, the, explain that to me. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my, this story is just up, down, around, everywhere. But anyway, look, the shrimp, you basically, you, you go in with a net, um, just like a long net, and you put a tennis ball in it so the net floats up. Okay. Right, you have a tennis ball in the end of it. It's a long net, like just put that big. Mm. And you just la you lamp them and the shrimp just stay there. They're like stunned with the light. And as you go over with your net, you hold the light on them and then you just, you just ah. and the shrimp bend up in the net. And I don't know, they mustn't be able to swim down. They just, and as you swim forward, they just, they don't come out. And what do you do to shrimp? Eat them. Throw them on the barbie. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. The Swan River is renowned for bull sharks. That's you're, fucking not good news. So you're in there, in the black dark, lamp and shrimp. And we were green, so, we, you know, the first time we went, we had to hire a couple of torches, and I hired gear. My, my mate, had Cormac, had gear. Two cowboys now. We, we, we arrive down to this dive site, and uh, we make a plan. Like, we're fairly green. I'm a chancer. Like, I just have a go. Just have a go. And we, we, we're all... We're in our wetsuits and ready to go. And then my torch stops working. And it's like, fuck it, we're after spending this money now, we're going one torch. And I think he had one little small torch as well. So 
we get in the water. It's all like it's hot now. We're in our in our uh, wetsuits. It's bloody hot. And we're even at nighttime. Yeah, nighttime. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. It's Australia. Like sure in summer, like at nighttime, it'd probably it'll only come down to like twenty eight, twenty seven, or you know, twenty eight, twenty seven degrees. Just sweaty balls. <laughs> But you go, once you get in the river, you're going down to maybe 19, 20 meters. So it's 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 cold enough. But anyway, we... I 20 said, meters. Yeah. So I go to Cormac. And the other thing is, right, I, I'm very good at uh, navigating underwater, but you have a compass. And the thing is, you go out in the river, the river naturally starts to, to go down. But we agreed we would go to, say, 19, 20 meters, and then we turn around. And you try to come straight back to where you got in. like So you have to navigate. You've nothing to, to tell you other than the... The compass but sure now we basically had one torch so we're trying to lamp shrimp and navigate so you have to keep an eye on the your <laughs> your compass make sure you're staying on your bearing so that you know you're going to turn and come exactly back and every now and then i let Hormock do the the shrimp part first and uh, i was trying to lamp for him and do the and every now and then i'd hit the button on the on the torch and there'd be black darkness and his arms would be flailing around <laughs> trying to grab me anyway sure he had a leak in his fucking tank and he had a smaller tank and then he ended up running out of air we only caught like a handful of shrimp right this is a ho- this is some fucking bad experience <laughs> and uh he ran out of air and um because we Not were good underwater by the way <laughs> ish, oh, i'm embarrassed to say the next part because we were, because we only had one torch and, and we were a bit nervous, we kind of had clipped the rope between us, which you shouldn't do. But because we only had one torch and the thing happened, we'd, you know, kind of be able to, it was just some fucking cowboy shite we were doing. And then he runs over there and he panicked and he should have came to me because I had a spare reg as you, you know, you give the other reg to the other diver. To, I thought you were going to get air in your mouth and shift him. <laughs> <laughs> Take my air. <laughs> Oh, stuff. Anyway, he shot, to, he tried to, to go to the surface and then he, 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 he clipped himself, whatever, and he shot to the surface, which is a bad thing to do because you can get the bends, which is a nitrogen bubble in your in your blood or go to your brain and create an aneurysm or a pulmonary, what do you call it, when your lung over expands? Well, pulmonary seizure or something. Yeah, pul- oh, I can't think of it. I, I should know. I do know. I just. But anyway, I had to take my time. I had to just take my time going up and I did not know what, I was going to find on the surface and I got up and he was gasping, gasping, but he was grand. <sighs> and anyway, I was relieved. So we what the fucking sharks though? Ah, fuck the sharks. <laughs> Did you ever see one? Uh, no, no, but you see, they don't have good, uh, sometimes the visibility is bad and they don't have good vision. So they tend to bump into something and then they bite it. That's what they do apparently. No, I fucking hope yeah. would I get in yeah. if I, was, I thought there was a shark. I in was there. in Perth there in 2023. Um, and yeah, a girl, on, a girl on a jet ski had jumped off it to swim with a couple of dolphins. And a bull shark came up and I think took her leg and she'd actually died when I was there. I couldn't believe it in, in the swan. But it's just been a few. It's been a few. It's, look, it's not that common. And like, I'm the sort of lad I will push. I'll push life to the limit. I will. I want to feel alive. Even now? Oh God, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to feel alive. But, um, so that was that. We did that a few times, but we still dive together. We uh, we dive here in Ireland and... Uh, what do you dive in Ireland? There's, um, I'm actually, so I'm a commercial diver. Actually, that's the other part of that story. Um, but here in Ireland, we do a few shore dives and sometimes you do a boat dive. The diving off Ireland, if you get the weather window, the visibility is, it can be unbelievable. It's very cold here, but it's amazing. So boat boat wrecks and different things. Is there? Oh God, yeah. There's there's thousands of boat wrecks around Ireland. Yeah. And they allow just go out and look at them. You can, yeah. You're not meant to take stuff. What to take? <laughs> no count. Any gold? <laughs> there's no treasure. <laughs> I wouldn't tell you. I just the big big chests with treasure is all I think. I gold know. bars. <laughs> sure, when when I meet people and I tell them I'm a commercial diver, they go, oh, what do you do? I look for treasure. But that, that's what yeah, I'm I thinking. Know, I know, but... What do commercial thing. divers do? We um, build yachts. Underwater. Un- underwater. We weld, survey, salvage, um, you name it, we'll do it. Honestly. Anything you can do on the surface, I'll do underwater. 
and in a, a diving suit or a diving no uh, yeah so in ireland you wear a dry suit because it's it's cold so you'd have a dry suit on with thermals underneath depending on type of year time of year you you would have thicker or or skinnier thermals on you know how deep can you go down i'm legally allowed to go to 50 meters 50 fucking meters yeah. the only, right it doesn't i say it and it doesn't sound like much but if you get an olympic pool right and you turn it on its end it's a long way from It's there. a long way. It's a long way. I, I, I've I asked this question, right? Because I often wondered, when you're down 50 meters, can you feel the weight of the water? Oh God, you can. Oh yeah. Like, it, can you feel no, it squeezing no, on you? No. So, so the dry suit, the dry suit has um, a pipe in your chest here. You look like Iron Man, there's a big valve hmm. on the front and then there's a, a dump valve on your arm to let out the air. So when you're on surface, so uh, the dive gear I use is a, a big Kirby Morgan helmet. It's 14 kilos. This huge, it's big helmet. It's got a camera and a light and a microphone and, and speakers in each ear. Is it like space though? Basically, yeah. Yeah. And then you put on a bell jacket, which has a spare bottle on your back. And it's got a row of weight to bring you down. Like a lot of weight. So the jacket can weigh 35, 40 kilos plus your 14 kilo helmet. Before you get in, how much oh, you weigh? Fuck it. I don't know. It, I do them, do the math. It's heavy. It's heavy on the surface. I've got a big fat neck from rugby. I have to, when I'm waiting to get in the water, I have to hold the helmet because it's just a, and, but once you're in the water, you're weightless. As long as you get your lead right, it's just beautiful. You've got a dry head and you can talk and hear, and then there's an umbilical that runs the surface. So there's a, there's three, three um, parts to it. There's a comms line, your airline, and there's a pneumo, which can be used as a backup airline, but the pneumo is for a depth, depth gauge. So they, they, they pressurize it, they push air, it's just an open-ended pipe. They, they blow it out and then they turn off the valve and then the back pressure tells them how deep I am. Fuck me, the trust you have to have for the guys up above you. Yeah, but you do. You have to trust the lads and it's a, it's a five-man team. So you'd have a supervisor, dive supervisor, he'll have diver one and then diver two is your standby diver and then two tenders that will dress, dress you in and manage your umbilical and hand you tools and, you know. And how long can you stay underwater working? What's the longest? Look, it's all about depth. Um, most of the work we do in Ireland is only down to six to 10 meters, but like six meters, you can stay all day. I've worked seven and a half hours underwater. I don't think anyone in, in our company can match that. I was just trying to get a job done. Horrible job and had to get it done. And I came out of the water at half nine at night. Holy shit. Yeah. And have you ever worked, um, have you ever seen that weird down there? No, but I was working down in, um, what do you call the little town, just north, or no, Kinsale. I was down in Kinsale there, we were doing a big uh, pier extension years ago. It was, one of the, it was a lot of diving on that job and it started out in the summer and it was crystal clear. The, the water was like gin. It was amazing. And then winter came and between the dark days and then all the, you know, the flood run off in the rivers, there was no visibility. Like I couldn't see my hand. How do you work like that? Close your eyes. Feel. So you just close your eyes and... You know, say, say this is the hmm. site, you come in here, you know where the shutter is and what's been done and you'd listen to what the other divers would be doing when you're, you'd are you be in the dive shack. And uh, when I get in the water, I just close my eyes and uh, it's like in your own house. I don't know if you ever get up and go to the toilet at night and I would never turn the light on. I'd know I'd have to walk this far and same thing on the site. You just close your eyes, you build a map and you know where everything is. You put down a hammer, you'd know where it is. You just know. It's slow though. Everything is slow because it's a one man job. You can only have one diver in the water because you have to have a, a standby ready if anything goes wrong. Um, so you could be putting in massive shutters, massive, you know, blocks. And it's a one man job and it's slow. You're banking a crane in the, like he's obviously above water and you're in the water and you're telling them up, down, float it out or in. And you have to have a good, uh, spatial awareness or, or um, I don't know like you have to know which way is which because yeah, you, you're in a 3D environment you can get you can get misplaced like and even the best divers do but I have a very good sense of direction in the war I, I literally never get lost have you know. a good sense of direction period yeah yeah no map you'll kind of figure it out yeah yeah never got lost in any of my trips how the fuck is that possible Actually, how would you get lost you don't know where you're going <laughs> that's a great point <laughs> that's a great point and when when you um do the job you're doing say like I do forestry I'd love to drive real big machines do you ever think God you know what 
I'd love to go real deep, 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 deep. No. No, no thanks. Go down and look at the Kursk. No, no, I have no aspirations for that at all. There's just special, specialist divers, I don't know what to call them. The, you know, the Lusitania is off Kinsale there, and that's at, a hun- is it 95 or 110 metres, which is ridiculous. Those boys go in the water, they could be there for seven, eight hours. They get down to it. Yeah, they're on rebreeders and things. So a rebreeder is basically you reuse your air, but it's oxygenated. True, I don't, oh, I don't know the ins and outs, but it's if it goes wrong, you're on your own, you're done, and quite a few people die at it. But they go to places that not many people have been to. For me, I do like that. I love going places where no one has been to. But just being a diver, like you know, you've a good chance of going somewhere where no one has been to, or very mm. few people have. That's what I like. But it's like I said, I like feeling alive, but that just does nothing for me. If it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. Yeah, not for me. Jeez, that was a really interesting diversion, I have to say. Now, that's a cool mm-hmm. job. So that was it. When I came back from Australia, mm-hmm. um, I went and did my, um, it's three months to get qualified in, in Scotland. That's what I did um, instead of staying in Australia. And then back to the biking. So mm-hmm. the plan was to come home, do the diving, which I had booked in. I was home for two or three months and then I, I went to Scotland for three months. And that was like my my college life condensed into three months and I had some crack. I drank nearly every day. <laughs> I went wild. I went wild. And uh, I still... And I, crammed. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, no, I, I found it all very interesting. The first month was very full on the, 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 the amount of paperwork and stuff you have to learn. Tables, dive tables and regulations and all the stuff. But I just, yeah, that was my college and I had a really good time. And then I came back. And before I left there, actually, I um, I wasn't even finished my course. And I wrote, I sent a CV to four companies in Ireland. There's only five or six, five companies in Ireland doing diving. like, And two of them are in Wexford. And the two in Wexford rang me back straight away. It was on a Saturday or something or Sunday. And he said, because uh, they ringing me on an English number. And I said, um, are you available? I said, yeah, in two weeks I'm available. <laughs> and how come you're on an English number? I'm uh, still doing my dive course. <laughs> uh, but the reason they were ringing me back is I, I had a wealth of experience um, in, in construction and civil and building and all that. And basically the diving is just like your... Doing like, all that underwater. But, but yeah, but diving is just like your, your taxi to work, you know, just being able to dive. That's great. You could be able to dive, but you might not have hands to bless yourself. You know, so all, all, all being well, like you can dive, but can you weld or can you, can you do a bit of concrete and, or place a, you know, you have to be able to think and do stuff. So young divers are so green. It can be, it can be frustrating. You you, sh- you really should go work on the sites. First. Yeah. Get some hands-on experience. And then, then you, once you're in the water, you'll be comfortable. You can just get going. You'll be fine. So I did that, but all the while doing this, I was planning to go to Mongolia. And I got home 2013, March, was it something like that? And I bought a bike out of Germany. I went to talk to some friends and they recommended a bike and we had a quick look online. And these are actually overlanders in Gori. They do like massive adventure travel. They have an adventure motorcycle shop. But they were only starting out at the time. And then Derek, the dad, told me it was this DR650. It's a Suzuki um, air cooled, very simple bike in Germany. And it was in 1998 with 3000 kilometers. And it looked like it just came off the showroom and he was going out there in a week or two to, to pick up bikes. And he said, he'd have a look and he bought it for me. And it was just immaculate. How much was it? I think it was, it was a three year, it was either 3000 euro or 4000 euro, but it was, it was a brand new bike. And I got that and I started learning just doing some sort of off-road riding around Ireland on the beaches and up the odd green lane and the mountain track, trying to... Get used to it. Yeah, a few tip, <clears throat> few little small, uh, spills here and there. But And then I was planning, trying to figure out a route and visas and how to build a bike and what to bring and luggage and suspension and tires and you name it. Are you, is someone telling you what to, are you just figuring all this out yourself? Yeah, no one. I had, that's the thing. I've said this to a lot of people. Um, I had no one, but the reason I'm kind of coming on here tonight as well is that if there's anyone that has any questions or anyone that wants to do this, they can contact me and I'll share any wealth of knowledge they want. Um, but I had no one. 
I had to find my own way. Um, and yeah, I had online, but nowadays it's, it's a big thing, the adventure motorcycle travel. But so yeah, I spent, I actually left in May, 7th of May, 2015. And I started planning around, I guess, March, 2013. So I'd been, you know, planning quite a lot in the background and, and figuring it all out and looking at things to see and do. And, and, you know, smartphones were a thing 2015, but I didn't really use it much in, in Russia and out places. I just, just fucking, I don't know how I, I just dealt with it. And I, were I you excited to start or were you nervous when you started? Oh God, nervous. Yeah. What have I done? Yeah. So I did look, I did it for charity, I did it for cancer, Irish Cancer Society had a big fundraiser and lots of people helped out and donated things. And it, it, in the end, I made um, 14,000 euro, which was great to be able to give them. But yeah, got on the ferry and I had a bit of a going away thing. I know a few people came to the house and the local paper and, you know, and that was grand. That was easy enough. And I packed up the bike, but again, the bike was overloaded. I had too much shit in it and I brought a spare wheel. Because I thought I wouldn't Where get... Where would you have that? Oh, I'll show you a picture there. I had a... So basically, the the bike is at 650cc. It's kind of like... looks like a motocross bike in a way, oh. an enduro. And um, I had two luggage bags, soft bags on each side, hanging down, like pannier bags. And then I had a top box, a Pelican case on the back. What bike was it again, sorry? Uh, Suzuki DR650. Hmm. DR650, thank you. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I, I built the luggage rack myself a bit of steel. I tried to make it as light as I could, but strong, you know. And I was trying to save money instead of buying racks, which should have bought the racks. So I had the Pelican case, I had a tire on top of it, and then I had another roll bag or two, like waterproof bag on top. I was carrying weight. I sure it was green. Like, and I didn't know what you needed yeah, or not needed. Yeah, and I thought, oh, sure, I'll use this, I'll use this, and I, I might use that. And day one on the trip, I was giving away things. Any, was, of, any of these, is it? Uh, yeah, it's. Um, do you see the one there, the fourth one, or the top the one in the middle? Yeah, it's something. Like, it looks something like that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that also has shit. a lot of bikes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but look. Um, yeah, I just I didn't know. Anyway, so but I go down to Rosslare to get on the ferry, and my sister was repeating an exam that day, and she came from Waterford to see me off and my dad and a few other people and the girl I've seen at the time came down and they said goodbye to me then, you know, more of a private sort of a just good luck. And they said goodbye to me and started, like my old lad started crying and and my sister and everyone and like thought they'd never see me again. And I was like, Jesus, tonight lads. I, 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 I didn't know what to think or do. Like I never had such a, I'd been to Australia and to New Zealand and it was grand, but they really thought they were never going to see me again. And it was a bit tough, like, and then I got on the ferry and I went to Sherberg and it was like, it was 19 hours or something. And uh, when I got on the ferry, I was shitting. Why? I just, panic came over me. What have I done? And between the emotion that was shown on the, mm. before I got there and, oh man, I was just like, what have I done? Sick, stomach was in knots. And then I got on the bike and uh, the minute the front wheel touched French soil, Forgot. Calm, just calm. It was just fine. Yeah. It was just amazing. And did you just ride every day until you got tired or did you stick to a real strict sure. plan? I had like a timeline. The thing is Mongolia, like you have to be in and out of Mongolia before September, out before the before September because uh, it's, real, it's real warm in the summer and then it's pretty Baltic in the, in the, in the winter. So... I just had a rough timeline and I actually, the, actually my timeline was done with the Russian visa and Kazakh visa. The Russian visa was quite hard to get and I had to get a business class visa. So to get a multi, multi-entry multi cost me like 700 euro and my passport was gone for like six weeks and I had to tell him a window of within a week, like uh, say the 30th of March to mm. or whatever. Um, so it was tight. So I had all those kind of constraints on me and it all worked, but. Did you find it like physically hard? Like that was your first time going really, really, really long ways, like on bad roads, like where you broke up? Like. No. 
fucking the saddle on the bike was fucking that was violent i changed like the bike comes with a real narrow soft squidgy saddle and it's horrible like you'd be like left cheek right cheek left cheek right cheek trying to ease the yeah, pressure yeah but then i put on a wider saddle but it was too hard and i um on the trip I, well, beforehand, like I'd re, I'd, I'd, I'd done the bike up, I'd changed suspension and luggage racks and lighting and, you know, put on a, a USB charger and a few bits, you know. But my arse, it took two weeks for my arse to get used, to, acquainted to this uh, saddle. And eventually that was it, it was fine. Um, physically, no, because I started out in Europe, it was fine. The roads were good. I went down through France, I went to Paris, down through the Swiss Alps. I went down to, um, where did what's they call it? Venice. Had a look at Venice. Never, ever go there, lads. It is. Why? It's just jammers. Mm. I went in early, as early as I could, and I was gone by half 11 or 12. It's just nuts. Yeah. It I look so at, calm in the films. Yeah. Anyway, and then I, I went down to Croatia and I did uh, Dubrovnik. It's beautiful too, but super busy again. Go in early, get out. Um, and I kept going down through Albania. Albania is like the third world country of Europe. But I've heard nice things about Albania since, and I just had a bad experience. It was just like you'd be driving down the road, and there was manholes missing and the lids, you know, the covers. Yeah. And I nearly took the wheel off the bike and it was just chaos. And they have no county council there because they can build whatever they want. <laughs> yes. But look, kept going. And I got to Turkey and then I started to, it was like two or three weeks in and I started to get routine and start to understand how to pack the bike and what to do and. How little you needed? Well, no, I still wasn't at that stage. No, actually, no. I was still giving away things. Yeah, I was giving away things. Um, I had some lovely experiences. I was couch surfing. I was wild camping. Um, some cheap hotels. I went hot air ballooning in Cappadocia, which is amazing. I did a, I did like um, an internet, like the, I got asked into a school in Turkey, which was quite fun with about 50, 14 or, fi 14 or 15 year olds. And sure, I didn't know I was put up in stage and your man expected me to have a, a PowerPoint <laughs> and he had the projector screen and he had a map of Ireland and he had Googled, I don't know, generic Irish things. And I, I was the talk, sure, Jesus, I didn't know. And I was trying to keep a blog up while doing all this um, pictures and, and I was writing up like, like full kind of blog every day for every day and it was full on too so I took on a lot but I had an amazing time so I kept going Georgia was an amazing country I just I was trying I was were you falling in love with it or was you just were you just trying to get through that one no I was definitely falling in love with it but I was conflicted that I needed to stay to this time schedule and at times I was a bit behind or I'd meet someone and I'd stay for a a couple of days for people and uh and then you'd have to rip yourself away and go again and i stayed with quite a few people i met pe just just met people i had no contacts except for one guy in mongolia yeah um yeah i just i just i just meet people so on my trips all of my trips now it's probably about three and a half years combined four big trips around the world i say a third of my time is spent over a third of us is spent with just people I meet, random people on the road. I stay with them. The other third would be wild camping. And then the last third would be in paid, you know, maybe motels or cheap, cheap Airbnbs or whatever I have to get. I don't like those because there's nobody to, because I'm a solo traveler. There's no one to really, unless you want alone time, you're in a hotel room looking at the wall, you know. Whereas if I'm inter, if I'm staying with someone, they're going to, show me the local cuisine or bring me to the local waterfall or you're really getting to know the local or, areas yeah or i hang out with them and help them do something like um you just don't know what's going to happen like it's you just don't know I, like i don't know how to say it yeah like i I, man, I was in a movie and i got pulled into a, as an extra in a movie in the states i put a, a dc3 engine in an airplane in alaska there's just all sorts of things yeah you just don't know. That's definitely living. Yeah. So look, I, I continued anyway. Um, there's so many stories. I don't know what to say. When, when you finished that trip yeah, and you came home, how long was it before you were planning your next one? Well, it wasn't straightforward as that. I made it to Mongolia. And on the way over there, I'd actually cracked the frame because I was carrying too much. And I was riding like a lunatic. 
like as fast as I could go and I was dogging the bike the now that is <laughs> there's a lot of creepy people listening to this the bike Jesus what kind of followers do you have uh, there's a few weird ones <laughs> so um, yeah I cracked the frame and actually going going across Kazakhstan um, by the way Kazakh people are the most the, the most friendly kind giving people I've ever met in the world but well, anyway, going across Kazakhstan, the, the base gasket on the engine blew out and started pissing out oil. And it looked worse than it was because when oil comes out, it seems to just... Go everywhere. Yeah, it, it, it looks worse than yeah, it is. Especially when it's hot. Yeah. So anyway, I keep going, a bit of extra oil, and then I get to um, Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan and I'm at the Tajik embassy. So I have to go to the embassy to get a visa. And when I was there, this um, Swiss guy pulled up and then an American on a, on a local bike... Um, his name will come to me anyway brad <laughs> call him brad <laughs> we'll call him brad um but he um i got chatting to him and i needed parts i needed a new base gasket. i need to pull the engine apart i just I, I like to have things right so i got his address and his number and he said no about her so i rang up the bike shop in gory and i said lads i need this 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 and this and i dh dhl'd it out so I headed off for another two weeks with the bike and I got a bit of silicone, this engine silicone, and I cleaned it off and I just put it in. It lasted a week, never leaked, didn't leak for a week. And I went to Tajikistan. I had all sorts of ups and downs and amazing times. There's just not enough time to go through all of it. Anyway, I came back to, to this guy and he was running an orphanage with his, with his wife. And sure, the parts took forever to come. Actually, sorry, back up. I was on my way to meet him. He'd come down about 500k to meet me and go camping and show me around. And I took the worst road I had took on the whole trip by accident. And I just realized when I started it that the frame had broken, the crack, like the engine or the chassis had cracked really badly. I'll get, I'll get a picture for you later so you can... Moving around. Oh yeah, yeah. You thought it was an extra suspension, but it was actually pulling the big part. <sighs> oh yeah, there's like a, there's a, um, there's a strut bar that comes from where the swing arm is mm. up to the back to carry the back of the bike. And it just like broke and it was so your suspension was holding it together i don't know what it was fresh air um so i got i found a piece of wood and i got every cable tie i had so i, <laughs> I, I splinted it i put a piece of wood between the two and i put every cable tie on it and i was like right i'll drive slow and i i was about three hours late for your man right and to be fair to me he waited where he said he would and he was like a bull he tried to kill me and i just said mac that's his name now Mac, I go, Mac, 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 just calm down, calm, calm down. And I said, come here, come here, come here, come here. And he was just like a ball. And then he, I, he had one look and he goes, ah, okay. <laughs> I get you. Yeah. I'll give you a pass on this yeah. one. So we found a place to camp for the night and then that was it. We couldn't do a trip. So I just babysat the bike all the way back to, to Kyrgyzstan along with him. And I got into the orphanage and he put me up in a house with his son. Uh, his son was about, about my age, maybe a bit younger. And I ate. I was there for 10 days, I'd say, and I ate three meals a day with the kids, hung out. One of the guys, Timor, he was my assistant mechanic and he um, handed me the wrenches and I took the whole bike apart, went to get it fixed, welded. And the place I went to, you know, sometimes you see in the movies, these, these guys have very primitive tools and they'll do the most amazing job. Mm. Well, that's the place we ended up in was like that. And I was like, I hope these guys are just amazing. And he did the worst job you ever saw. Really? Oh my God, like they might as well have. Looking, wrecking your bike. They just, they tried to play it up and they wouldn't let me use the welder, wouldn't let me do it. I can weld, I can do it all. They wouldn't let me use anything and they made an absolute. Shave it. Shave it. And then they went to charge me $200 and one of the local guys was with me and he spoke Kazakh and he's like, get fucked. So I, he says, pay local rights. So it's, I don't know, $20. Sure. Anyway, so the, I had the right time there. The parts came to fix the bike, and which believed they were the wrong parts. Oh, for fuck's um, sake! It was a different. Uh, the gasket was for the head, not the the base. And um, so your man Mac had some gasket paper, and we just made up a paper gasket. He showed me how to do it, and we did that. Put the engine back in, and Timor again helped me do the whole thing. And um, eventually, I got my way, and sad to say goodbye. I had a really good time there, just to see the kids and just hang out and. Bring them, we brought them up camping and I was driving them around and doing things. It was really nice, really nice. So I get going, I get to Mongolia eventually. And Mongolia is a tough place. It's There's no roads, like literally. Dirt yeah. roads, if you're lucky. There's, yeah, not even. There's no graders. There's just, 
there's no bridges. Like basically. So if you get to a river, you just cross the river. You just find where the locals are crossing. Yeah. I had one big river to cross and I spent an hour driving uh, parallel to it up and down trying to find a place. And I hadn't done a big river across. You'd want to have a good sense of direction doing that. And I'm by myself, right? And um, I finally just got annoyed. There was these massive horse flies and they were biting me. And they were biting me through my motorcycle gear. Like there was vents in my in my pants and in my jacket. And they were actually biting me through them. Motorcycle gear is quite thick and heavy. Yeah. Like. So, yeah, I just said, F it. I'll go here. So I took the bags off the bike in the box and I carried them across to the far side. And this was like kind of one of these rivers with these, you know, sort of the size of your fists are bigger, kind of round, round rocks and just hard just, walking. Never mind walking. <clears throat> I was worried about driving the bike and it was fast flowing and it was deep. It was, it was up to the air box, but I had, I was confident enough. I was like, I can do it. So there was no one with me now and I hadn't seen anyone all day. And, uh, so I go for it. And uh, I remember I put the GoPro up at the far side on my helmet and I videoed it. You should see me bouncing down the river because the river was so fast. I had to go in up at one point and I must have drove, I must have drove 50 or 60 meters down the river at a slight angle to, to, mm. to get across without getting, without letting the water push the bike over. And uh, yeah, I did and got it up and I was so relieved. But back to Mongolia, there's, there's no roads. It's just... There's like two wheel tracks. Someone someone makes the first road. That gets a bit rough. Then they might stagger it or they might go beside it. And before you know it, there's 10 of these double tracks, Rigid. right? And you'd be following that one. And if you're not watching, that one will just start drifting off. Drifting off and then you meant to be going that way. I never I never got never got it wrong, but a lot of boys have. Yeah. No signs, no nothing. But it's so remote and cool and like you see the. Were you ever scared there? No, 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 no. You see the girl tents and the locals, and they're all they were all really friendly to me. I had no issue, and I just camped wherever. And you videoed yeah. all that, did you? I did. Yeah, I I made YouTube videos, and I'm sure I didn't know what I was at. Is that YouTube video still up there? It is. Yeah, yeah. Go look at. We put a link on. Yeah. So, look, I didn't know what I was doing. Sure, I I had a, I used my phone a bit and my GoPro and. I hadn't edited video, never, I hadn't even edited a video before I went. I just captured lots of footage and I lost the first half of it in, um, from Ireland to Russia, no, Ireland to Georgia. I, I had all that and I was trying to, um, upload it onto a hard drive in, in Vol Volgograd in Russia. And I was staying at this biker, um, guest house or this biker club. So it was on the beer, <laughs> Belubas. And I just bought a hard drive and I had to reformat it for the Apple. And I had the two hard drives in. I should have had unplugged the good one. <laughs> and I reformatted the one with all the fucking oh, footage. No. Yeah. So I lost, I lost all the footage. So you were me. like a fucking bull, didn't they? I was, and I spent a few days there. And I, my friends that I made, a local guy was like a tech whiz. And I brought it to him to try and... Save it. Yeah, save it. And he saved some pictures and a few bits, but nah, it was corrupted. Look... Actually, do you know what was grand? The main footage I got was from um, from Russia on and Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Mongolia. Like you'll see if you ever look at it, it's amazing. Even though, like, I just happen to have my camera on at times when you meet people and you crash and yeah, yeah, you just the timings were good. Do you have any bad crashes out there on that trip? Yeah, that's where I was going. So after I got to Ulaanbaatar, the frame had cracked again, right over the boys' weld and everything. So. My contact in, in Ulaanbaatar, he'd went to school with, um, actually, so my girlfriend at the time, her sister had a friend from Ulaanbaatar. She lives in Dublin and she put me in touch with her brother. She said, he'll look after you if you need anything. And I was like, amazing. Cause at least I had a postal address. Cause send stuff. Yeah. Send stuff out. So I stayed with him. EK was his name. Very nice guy. Um, I stayed with his family and his mate, runs a massive fabrication shop. Like they, they would weld, you know, buckets for sort of two, two or 300 ton diggers, like a okay. huge shop. And I go in and it was a public holiday and he got his best welder in or two of his best men in. He said, lads, he's in work today. And my friend EK had a mechanic friend and he came, we, we took the bike apart. Me and mechanic did a bit of work on the carburetor and the bearings and checked everything over. And the, this other guy welded it. 
He went and plasma quite a play. Perfect. Well did it in, did the most amazing job. And then he had came back with blue paint. And the frame was actually purple. I was like, grand, slap that on there, lad. I was like, that'll do. And he goes, mm-mm, no, won't do. So he comes back and I don't know what other color he got, whatever color you have to mix in blue. But he came back. Uh, purple. Mix it properly. Yeah, yeah. It was like a matte purple, but it was purple. Because it's glossy purple on it. But anyway, mm. yeah, he did some job. So he's delighted. And in the meantime, I had a Finnish friend who was on, uh, who was riding um, from Finland, obviously, to Mongolia and then to India and stuff. And I didn't know he was on that trip. I met this guy in Thailand in 2013. And he just wrote to me. He saw me on my post on Facebook and he goes, hey, I see you're going to Mongolia. I was like, I am too. So he was waiting in Ulaanbaatar for me to go down to the Gobi Desert. He was a bit afraid of going by himself. So we'd been in a Muay Thai camp in, in Thailand together and both two competitive young lads. Didn't show you each other? Yeah, well then, yeah, in the camp we were, I was, big, I was bigger than him, but he had a smaller bike. When I back to the trip, he had a smaller bike than me and we go down to the desert and we're getting on our right and we're, you know, we're pushing each other. And because I'm with someone now, I feel safe. I feel like I can... Go a bit harder. Yeah, and if anything happens, sure, he'll pick me up, like, mm. you know. Worst thing ever. So we unload our bikes. We're at the massive sand dunes of the Gobi, like you'd imagine in the Sahara. You know that? Is that what it's like, really? Yeah, there's an area there that's just just dunes. And it's just... And is that where you're riding or is there a road? There's like a dirt track. Yeah. Up and down dunes. It No, no, you're, you, you ride alongside the dunes. It's kind of gravelly, gravelly and a bit sandy, the road. And then you just see the dunes. And we were like... Let's go. So we drove in a good bit. We unloaded our bikes and then we went for it. And like, I'm on a 650. It's not for sand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm green now. I've never ridden in sand. Maybe a little bit on the beach. Barely. Yeah. And now I'm an expert. Like you should see what I do with fully loaded bike in sand. That same bike, I can send it anywhere, anywhere you want. Because I have the experience. But anyway, your, your footage footage is absolutely stunning. I'm watching it here for the last couple of minutes. Oh, his, his photography on so, your last trip was out of this world. I, I'm watching the first episode of the Canada one oh, here, yeah. and fucking the the footage you capture is just savage. Yeah, I had the drone for that, so you'll see yeah. lots. We'll yeah. put the links up for the videos on yeah. underneath. But um, so anyway, we go for it, and we we we're getting dogged. You know, it's, the sun is baking, and there's this one big dune, just this huge dune. We both look at each other and we, as I say, and he goes, nah, mate, your bike won't go up there. He's like, fucking right, you Hold my beer. Yeah, hold my <laughs> It was one of those moments and I just sent it. Second, I had it in second gear. You couldn't go in third, you'd start, because you, you need high revs, you'd be spinning a lot. I just flew up this dune, right? Just straight up. And I was like, oh my gosh, you some some bike. And then I let off the trial. Still going, still going. And then I expected the dune to just be round, right? So I go up like this, and it was a knife edge. Oh, fucking hell. And the back end was just even a steeper drop. And I let off. I don't, I don't remember breaking. I should have braked. Again, green, never been in sand like that. And uh, I went straight out over it, and time has never went so slow. That's the only moment in life I've ever had that time just nearly stopped and I was on the bike motocross level holding on just two weeks yeah but sure again I'd never done a jump like I never even done a jump because it you know depending on if the nose is dipping you might give her a dart at the throttle or if the nose is going up you hit the brake and it'll actually you can, you can in the air you can counter a bike yeah so if the bike was going if it's going up nose up the front wheel is going to be spinning if you hit the front brake it's like a pendulum but if you hit it hard it'll actually pull the front down Oh, it's like a gyroscope kind of. Yeah, just... yeah, sorry, gyroscope, yeah. But anyway, look, I was on the bike and everything went through my head. I was like, Jesus, you're only halfway through this trip. You need to get the bike home. You're going to break it now. You're going to wreck it. Like everything went through my head. It was just super slow. And as I was going, I was like, yeah, no, you got, the, you got this. Yeah, you, you got this. <laughs> and I kept going, it's going, it's going. And then, and then, and then it's going. And then the nose just comes down, the, t the rear comes up, right? And then it just... It touches the sand. The front wheel kind of just dug in. The bike just went like you. I'm going at a serious speed down this slope, and the bike came right over on me, landed on me, broke my collarbone, and uh, 
I bent the luggage rack off me and uh, the bike was roaring. I get up. I didn't know I'd broken anything. And I just like, I was like, Jesus, I'm still alive. Picked, I pushed myself up and I remember pushing and I was like, you know, something doesn't feel right. I stopped the bike and then I heard Yuha, the, the Finnish guy, roaring up the bank behind me at the other side. Oh, Jesus, he's coming as well. I was like, oh my God. So I was calm. Like I ran, I knew my collarbone was broke. I just knew by then it was broken and I, I ran up the dune. So it was like for every step forward, it was an, at more than half step. I was sliding back. Like So by the time I got to the top of the dune, he, um, his front wheel had broke out about a meter and a half. Thankfully, he didn't come on my track. He moved over a bit and he went out over it too, but he'd slowed off just a little bit more and landed it and he panicked and then there was a big dish. So he ended up stopping in a, like a huge dish hmm. in the bottom and he starts panicking and losing it. I said, just calm down, lad. You're grand. I said, I'm the one with a broken collarbone. I said, get your camera out. He had a good camera. I had a good camera too, but I said, get your camera out there and get a couple of pictures. And there was like a couple of pictures of me there lying on the, you know, the bike there. And it was just nice to have. So I got a bit of paracord and I made a sling and I was grand. Could you ride? No, I couldn't. Yeah, man, it was my right hand as well. It was, which I couldn't trottle. I couldn't do anything. And I broke the bone like clean, like, and it was just, it was no, no go. So he was in the dish. We, it was a big job to get his bike out. I had to drag it with him and he, and he riding it and trying to walk it. So we got it out. My bike is bigger and taller so i said to him but it was on the hill i said you go on have a go we'll try and get it out so he had to go got stuck we just left it there i had to walk three kilometers to the road but i walked straight line to the road but my luggage was like back to the left it was too far and i said you get my phone charger my passport and something else i don't know what i said to him so i hit it off excuse me I headed off with my uh, my helmet on my head. I don't know why. And um, a bottle of water. So I just, just started walking straight. And I got to the... When I was going to the road... Now, this isn't a very busy area. But at the time, there was... Three cars happened to be going the wrong way. But the first one didn't see me. And the second one didn't see me. And I was running and waving like a lunatic. Trying to just get someone to stop. And then the third car nearly passed me by. And they pull up and... Um, they get out and it's like a little tour. It was like a van, some sort of van. And there was two elderly American gentlemen with two um, two um, Filipino wives, younger, you know, you know the setup kind of. Mm. But they were nurses. So they told me they were nurses. I think they were more carers. And then one of them goes to me, she goes, um, oh, I told him, you know, it's broken, blah, blah, blah. And then you, I was waiting on you, huh? And she goes, oh, geez, you're going to get bone marrow poisoning. <laughs> Can, uh, I still haven't Googled if that's a thing, but I'm pretty sure it's not a thing. I love you long time, you yeah. get <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I was going to get bone marrow poison right now. Keep in mind, I am six hours from the nearest town, big town, with a shit hospital. And I'm another 10 hours from that town to the to Ulaanbaatar. And I had to sit down. I was the only time I, I got lightheaded. She said she put that bit of fear into me. Oh, for God's sake. So I sat down and I had a bit to eat and a drink. And then I said, I put that to bed. I said, I told her, zip it. <laughs> I just said, no more. Don't be putting them evils on me. Yeah. So um, that was grand. Eventually a car was coming the other way and they were full. It was a Land Cruiser and it was full, all Mongolian. You know, they couldn't speak any English. And they rejigged uh, the passengers. They're all stacked up in the back and they let me sit in the passenger seat. And it was on one of the roughest, well, you couldn't not call it a road. It was a track. And it was... No grader, it's never graded. So, and there's just ditches and washouts and you're just like this all day. And I had to, I actually had to sit up from the seat and like kind of. Counteract it. Yeah, move just to, so I get to town. I'm in this little town and I see this bike I recognize and it was a Portuguese biker I had met um, somewhere else in Mongolia. And he was staying with this uh, Italian lad. And I go into the, I see the bike, I get the Mongolian to pull up and I just go into this hotel and there's no reception. And I just, I was a bit desperate. So I just knocked on every door in the hotel till someone answered. And the boys answered <laughs> one of the doors, you know, and he came out and I said, look, I'm going to the hospital. Sure, I'll see you there. I'll try and stay here with you guys. And one of you drop me to the, to the bus in the morning. And that's what I did. They went to the hospital. They didn't want anything to do with me. They said, go to Ulaanbaatar. It's very rare, but it can happen. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. It's um, fat from the bone marrow bleeding into your, uh, going into your system. Wow. She didn't want to love you a long time. She was <laughs> fucking being honest. I feel bad now. Yeah, maybe. I actually, I can't believe I never Googled that. <laughs> Fuck. Like, that must be awful fucking scary. No. On your own. No. Well, you have was with me. And then, sure, I managed to see the two boys in this town called Dallin's a good dad. Anyway, that's grand. I get the bus 10 hours on a bus to Ulaanbaatar and there's a lad, there's music on the bus and it's Mongolian throat singing. Google that. Are you <laughs> really getting the vibe down, say, our head in the hospital. Oh, lads, it drove me. Blood poisoning. Yeah. Fucking. It drove me insane. Anyway, I get there. My friend picks me up. We go to hospital. He brought me to what he thought was decent enough hospital. We go in and waiting around and it's a bit slow and then. I'm waiting to go into the x-ray room and then this, this poor man gets dragged in by two. He looks like he's on a site or something. And two boys come in, dragging him in, like literally dragging his back along the ground. They had his hands and his feet. And he lost, say that's his foot, he lost about nearly half of his foot was just gone. The front half, like the toes and the... They drag him in, it was all wrapped up in bandages and yucks and uh, that's grand. And there was no one getting, Mongolians are very rude when it comes to queuing and stuff. They, they, they'll they skip you or they'll, they won't, just won't get out of your way. They're just very rude. They're nice people, but when it comes to queuing. They don't, don't get it. Yeah. So anyway, I actually had to get in front of the two boys pulling them and move people out of the way to get them in. So anyway, then I go in and get my x-ray and I'm standing up against the wall and then I turn around, face the wall, you know, they're getting different, making sure my back is okay because I got a good smack. And then I hear a bit of commotion behind me and then they're dragging them in and they lob them up on the x-ray table. It was just rough out. So anyway, the, the boys just confirmed, you know, I knew it was broken because I could feel the end of the, the bone. And I decided then and there, I said, I'm just going to go home and get an operation, get it plated. And because uh, it's, it's about six weeks really before you can ride a bike. Um, so that's what I did. I ended up, I, it took me a week to get, um, well, I had to wait for you had to get my passport and come back. But this guy knew a guy, my friend knew a guy in Dallin's Gidad. And you had called me on a sat phone. I don't know how he got a sat phone. Um, and he goes, look, at, oh yeah, before I left, I gave him $200. That's all I had on me. And I said, look, at, try to get my bike out. Do whatever you can. And sure, best of luck. <laughs> you just left everything there? Yeah, I just left everything. I didn't even have my fucking passport. That's the worst part. Anyway, so... Yuha went back that day. He got two local lads to come and help him. And he said, as he was getting it out, a sandstorm, it, like the wind, like a massive sand, sandstorm hit. And he said, the, only they got out, the bike would have been, I had, the, I had the GPS coordinates saved so we could find it. I, I saved them on the GPS before we left it. But he said it would have been just gone because the, the dunes shift. So he got it out. Because he's small and the two Mongolian lads are small, he ended up, must have, he burnt the clutch out of it. So he goes, good news, got the bike out, bad news, clutch is gone. I said, ah, oh, grand, don't worry. I said, I have, this, I have a brand new clutch in the right-hand pannier bag. And uh, he got pictures. He took out a couple of my T-shirts, laid them on the ground, put, dropped the bike on its side, pulled the whole side off, slapped in the clutch. He said the clutch didn't want to take. He had to jam it into gear and then it worked. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he got the bike back. He paid a local $50 to, to drive to Dallin's Gadad. I'd met an English guy in Kyrgyzstan who was riding from England to Mongolia for a second time. The first time he crashed in Mongolia, day one in Mongolia and broke his leg. Had an awful story, that guy, poor guy. But he was having a second attempt and he did it. And he was sh shipping his bike to Australia to continue his trip. And he had a few days to spare. So I put him on a flight. He, uh, he went down and drove my bike back through the night to to um, Ulaanbaatar, but he had an awful time. He got uh, four punctures. On your bike? On my bike. And sure, he couldn't find anything, but... This God. No, 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 no. <laughs> he said this was his best experience in Mongolia because he had a few things robbed on him this time, second time around, and the first time was a horrible time for him. He had a bad, broke his femur. His femur, isn't it, in your leg? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a bad one. Oh, he broke it, and he had to. He had kind of had to just sell his bike there and then. And the boys robbed his cameras and robbed jokes and he was in a bad way. And they, they just, anyway, second time around in West Mongolia again, he got robbed and a few bits and he just had a bad experience in Mongolia again. But he said, when he went down and got my bike, he said, the locals were amazing. 
They just helped him, fixed the bike, did everything for him. He said it's what he actually it just changed his 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 outlook. Well, perception on it. Yeah. On. Yeah. So I got the bike, put it in a container, eventually flew home, operation. And then uh Were you raging? No. I you know, I knew I was gonna go back and finish it. But everything happens for a reason. So did you start planning another trip then? So what happened then is I had to wait three months before I went back to work for this to, uh, well, close to three months before I could really go back hard at work. So it was coming up to November and I was going to go back to work and work was a bit quiet and I was doing light duties hmm. and I had a visa for Canada already got, which was, it was a bit of work to get a visa back then. And I had it and on a whim on a Sunday, I decided I'd go to Canada and I left on the Tuesday <laughs> And it was, sure, it was late November, it was nearly December, and it was just coming into snowy season in Canada. So I went to, called a lad, another lad from Wexford that was working out in a massive... These fucking Wexicans are everywhere. <laughs> I think the Irish are everywhere, come on. <laughs> um, he was out on a massive uh, tillage farm or a broad acre farm out in Manitoba, which is the prairies, like. I wouldn't send anyone out there now that I've been there, it's fucking boring. But I went out. I thought, geez, you know, Canada in winter, so where would you get a job? Like, and he goes, yeah, we've lots of work. They have a massive heated garage. You'd love it. And these, like, this farm is called Oranel Acres. They had 11,000 acres of like highly fertile land. And the fields are a mile by a mile. My God. That'd be so boring. Yeah, but not for me because they let me do everything. You know, I drove all the machinery. I did all the jobs. I did a bit of concrete and I did the digger work. I did fabricating. I did everything. So every day was different, you know, I really liked it, but yeah, that was a nice experience, you know, and I wanted to see a proper winter as well. So while I was over there, I was, you know, enjoying the whole experience. And then I started to learn Russian because the first time I didn't know any Russian, you know, I learned a little bit as I went. Started learning in Canada? Yeah, just by myself. You know, the evenings are a bit long. And, but I, yeah. No matter how long an evening has been, I have never said that to learn Russian now. Are you fluent in Russian now? No. <laughs> Do you know? That's, <laughs> a, <laughs> that, that's a big language, that. But that's a horrible language to learn. I think it's really bad coming from English. Uh, because their alphabet is like 35 Yeah, it's a, it's a mental letters, yeah. language. Yeah, it's, 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 and actually I can pronounce all the words really well. I used to know the alphabet because I haven't used it. Would you be proficient if you were in Russia to get stuff done? Enough, yeah. Yeah. Can you understand it? I can understand it more, better than I can talk. And the same goes for Spanish. I can understand it more than I can talk. I can, yeah. I, as long as I can understand, you can kind of communicate. Anyway, you can communicate with hand gestures and other things anyway. Wanker! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so where did you go after that? Um, so I went in Canada. I was planning this to, to go and get the bike and get back to Ireland. And I found this road in Russia called the BAM, the Baikal Amur Main Line. And basically, I think it was World War One. just after World War One, the Russians had um, blagged that they had a road from east to west, you know, but they didn't. But they had a train line um, over to Vladivostok, east to west, obviously from Moscow across. But it was very close to the Chinese border. And they were really worried about it. So they built this secondary line high in Siberia that looped around kind of stayed away from the Chinese border. But when the Soviet Union fell, they, uh, they stopped maintaining the, the access road for, for this train line. You know, it's when they built it and to maintain it. Um, and it's about 2,000 kilometers long, but 700 is ridiculously hard, like so fucking hard. And I was researching this like a lunatic because I wanted to do it. And you need to do it with someone. You, ha you should do it with someone. Like you need help. And I looked and looked and I found an American lad and some other lad that might have done it solo. They were what like, fucking group do you go on to, to find that guy? Like you just search the internet. You just scour through all the forums. Looking for and, another mad no, bastard. No, no, no. <laughs> but I just wanted to see, could anyone, has anyone done it by themselves? And I couldn't really find it. Everyone was in groups. I wasn't going to find anyone. I didn't bother. I said, I'm com I was confident enough that I could do it. So I, I had a brand new road legal enduro or a motocross tire uh, in Ireland and I put it into my suitcase. I had to put a ratchet strap around it and made it like oblong and I managed to get into my suitcase. 
I brought that with me. I slapped that on at the start of the road and that saved me. Like it's super aggressive tire. Put that on your your normal bike, yeah, bike you have. Yeah, yeah. And it only lasted like, I think I got 4,000 kilometers and it was absolutely in ribbons, but it did the job. And so I was going across, it was rivers. I spent three or four days with wet feet. Like, But are you camping out then? Like there's no yeah. stay? Ah, well, I stayed with... Oh, like I stayed in a hotel the day before I started it and it had rained for three days solid. Like, I mean, pissed. Absolutely. I was drowned. Everything was wet. And then it just, the sun just came out and for the whole road, it was amazing. But there was rivers and the bridges were all unmaintained and fallen down like these wooden bridges. And there was just holes, gaping holes in them everywhere. And you'd have to go across the rivers. And if you couldn't do that, you'd get up on the live railway bridge. And there's a very narrow corridor beside the track. To, to bring your bike along. And one of the bridges, a few of the bridges were like, you know, six, 700 meters long. Train coming, train yeah. coming. Yeah, just stop the bike, listen for a few minutes and go for it. And I actually got caught on one of them. They were replacing the sleepers and they left one big sleeper at the end and I got caught on him, body locked. And then I, the bike, I kind of dropped the bike in the back wheel kind of went out over the edge and it was jammed. And I was, man, I was panicking. And there was two boys down in the river fly fishing, looking at me. And I just fucking, just, I had to just manhandle it, drag it out. The wheel had went out over the side like it was, anyway, I got the bike up, got off and about two minutes later, the train came. Yeah. And the, the handlebar was literally on the track. Like it would have hit the bike and did a right bit of damage. But anyway, that was an experience. You on your own doing this? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's black bears in, in this part of Russia. And I stayed with some local people. I found a crack on the bike again and I pulled into this local lad and this, this woman spoke English. She'd been in one of the universities in, in Siberia and she hadn't spoke English in 17 years. And then she, this fucking tourist was here and she spoke to me. I'll tell you this story because this is, this is Russia. Her husband was there and she guided me to find a, a welder and she came out to the place and she chatted and she, she translated a bit. I had a bit of Russian. It wasn't great. Like it got better. And your man was sound out, fixed the, welded the bike, didn't want anything, filled it with fuel. Didn't, again, I've been filling, I'd filled up twice now with fuel and no, there's no fuel stations. There's these little towns and the only access is by the railway. They put their cars on the rail, on the track or the train, bring them in, take them off. There's, you couldn't come in with, by road. And each town is like, if you imagine those Soviet blocks, those huge apartment blocks. The, 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 it's like that really. Oh like, God, yeah. No yeah. access, like these enclosed little city towns. Yeah, yeah. and there's, there's tarmac for a kilometer each side of it and that's it. And a really good four by four or a six, you see, you ever see those Kamaz trucks? The yeah. six, those, those six wheel drive ones. Those are the things with the big, you need a big um, snorkel on them. And are they lovely people? Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. They're hard. Like they're hard from the Soviet times. Um, they're just hard people, but they're nice. Yeah. But anyway, this woman, she brought me around and she said I could stay. The husband was at work, right? So I'm at her house after everything's fixed up and what, we're just chatting. Yeah. What, yeah. What, yeah. What, <laughs> No, no, there was none of that. <laughs> but your, the husband wouldn't come home. He, and she goes to me, she was trying to pick her words. And she says, he's got a, uh, she kept trying to figure out how to say it. And then she goes, a quarrel. He has a quarrel with me. And I was like, oh, fuck. I just knew. Like Russian men. Yeah. Are tough. Tough. They can get jealous. They, uh, you know. I said, I said, geez. And anyway, she'd, she'd fed me and everything. And I was, I was just talking. It was just lovely, like. And uh, especially she spoke good English. And I said, oh, fuck that. I said, I, okay, I'm going to panic. Or not panic, I'm going to pack. Yeah. <laughs> I was panicking. I'm going to pack up and um, I'll just go. Don't worry about it. And she goes, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't. She goes, and then she goes, oh, okay. And she rang her dad. And her dad lives in like a, what's called a dacha. A dacha is like a little country home in Russia. So you have the big apartments, those, mm. those huge blocks. And then a dacha is like a little little house two or three beds with a with a plot where you can grow your vegetables and your food because most russians have a dacha and they grow their veg and their fruit so he turns up on a polaris quad big yellow quad and i follow him he doesn't speak any english ireland were playing in the soccer with the euros or something and it was on the tv i remember watching ireland in it was a russian i know this dacha and your man couldn't speak any english and we both slept in the front room and i was on a couch and he was like a bit of a, like a bachelor sort of as lad. And he, at one stage he lifts up the carpet and I'm like, what the fuck's this lad at? Like, 
because we couldn't really communicate properly. And he rolls back the carpet and then he lifts up a hatch. And I'm like, what the oh hell? God. <laughs> it wasn't going <laughs> And it turns out he was going down to get a bit of veg or fruit for um for the dinner or for this for the supper. Um so basically he didn't have a fridge and in Russia, because it's in that part of Russia they've got permafrost um or whatever it is. The cellar is like a fridge. It's a fridge during the summer and it's a freezer in the winter. So all his all his veg and fruit was was about 10, 11 feet down. And he had just a ladder. And it was just clay sides, like just clay. Yeah. So I stayed there. That was grand. I wasn't killed. And then I continued. It took a few days to get off the road. And I was so happy to see Tarmac. Oh, man. Anyway, so that was that. And I did it by myself, which that's one of my biggest achievements, I can say, because that road was not easy. I'll show you highlights later. And um, I made a video. At that stage, though, are you just, whatever happens, I'm not planning this too much. However well, long it takes me to do this. Or? No, no, I was under pressure because I told the Canadian farmer I'd be back for harvest. So I only had a two-month window. So I flew from Canada to Ireland, grabbed a suitcase to Mongolia, came back suitcase Canada and I came back once I got to Europe I I, I came down through like I, I spent a week in uh, Moscow Moscow was cool um I'd been to New York for three or four days and then I was in Moscow for probably six days I'd say I'd sooner go to Moscow really yeah it's intriguing the architecture the people everything it's very cool it's different like, it's very Is different it, Russia I think seems like it's like four different countries in one god yeah but sure, so is Canada. Canada is so different. Like all the provinces are so different. And all those big apartment buildings, they're all left over from the communist era where they were all just pegged up, isn't it, aren't they? Yeah. Well, they're not left over. They're still living in them. And they have that, um, that com not common, that heating system where they have one big like boiler in boiler, town. Yeah. And you see these ugly pipes, these insulated pipes running everywhere above ground. Oh, it's, it's an eyesore strange yeah no well it's just it's i guess it was their efficient way of heating all the buildings but yeah it's horrible it's just visually it's disgusting yeah so you're back in canada and then you're planning again back in canada yeah i am um, yeah I, I was i had a two-year visa but i or did i i think i had it i just did one year one and a bit and i was i kind of wanted to go home my dad was a bit lonely i think at the time there's a few things and I did a bit of a road trip across Canada to Newfoundland for Christmas with a girl that worked on the farm. And uh, we went down to New York and, you know, did a, but in winter, like we were trying to miss a blizzard down near one of the Great Lakes. We drove for 24, 25 hours straight trying to stay ahead of a blizzard. And then we got to New York, you know, did a few tourist things. Went to Newfoundland. Newfoundland's a cool place. So that, at this stage, the bike was at home and I'd been in Canada and I saw a little bit of Canada and I wanted to do, I wanted to go back to Canada with the bike and then I wanted to go to Alaska and then sure, if I go to Alaska, I might as well go down to Ushuaia in Argentina. You know, that's the way I was thinking. Sure, I'll be on the continent as such. So I started planning that. I only gave myself a year, saved up a bit and went for it. I went for that in 2018, in June, I think. Yeah. That was a nine month trip. Nine months. It should have been longer, but yeah, something happened. What happened? Fucking engine blew up in the bike. <laughs> Why didn't you buy a fucking new bike? Yeah. Well, no, I, the bike was grand. I did the piston rings. The engine was like new. Everything looked grand. And the frame had, I actually had to reinforce it. When I, when I got home from Mongolia, eventually the frame had cracked for a third time. And I did a job on it. I added about two kilos of steel to it, but. It wasn't going to break again. Never break again. It's like a tank. Yeah, so the bike wasn't going to break. Well, something something would have to break. You know, there'd, there'd always be a weak spot somewhere. But I was going, I dogged the bike. Now, I drive the bike every every day like it's its last day. That's how I do it. I still, I maintain it. And when something breaks, I'll, I'll fix it straight away. And like Ricky after. Bobby, if you're not first, you're last. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, I fly out as hard as I can go. And it's all, it's about the adrenaline too for me. Like I, I like the thrill of it. I like being on the edge. So on the road, I told you, like on tarmac, I said that earlier, on tarmac, I'll drive like the speed limit or 100K, even 90. But when I'm off road, Hard as I can go, or as harder than the road will let me, almost. But if you're on rough roads and you're driving, it's not hard on the body. Yeah, it is. But sure, 
I could do that for 40 minutes and then jump off and have a rest or I, I even less and I'll take pictures or I'll see someone or take a piss and whatever. You've got good at the photography over yeah. the last few years. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Your last trip is the one that I started watching you. Yeah, I think only uh, Ju- July or something when you yeah. started, yeah. I think my sister, did she? Someone sent me a picture and it was like I started, I didn't think I was ever into any of them things. Yeah. And then I started watching the photography and it was like, when you were doing the African trip, mm. how long were you doing that? About 10 months, maybe. 10 months. <clears throat> and I never seen nothing like it. One minute you're going through somewhere that looks like genuinely a war-torn country. A week later, it looks like you're in paradise. Mm. Yeah. And it changes that quick. Yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. Like, um, I guess maybe you saw some parts like, uh, where, Ghana, I'm just trying to think where you would have been. Yeah, look, most of Africa, once you leave South Africa, South Africa is very different. It's almost European at times, but then the eastern side of South Africa, it's, it's a bit rougher. Um, less developed maybe just some of the east but was that a scary trip parts of it um no I'll tell you why I I'll go back to this um look I finished the the American trip the engine blew Hmm. and uh, in in Patagonia and I I was tired I'd been putting in I was doing big mileage and I was trying to get to Ushuaia before winter. So, you know, I had to get to Alaska before it got cold. And then I had to come down across the the equator and get to Ushuaia and do things. Like my dad came out to Peru for, for nine days to see me. Well, um, in the and, middle of it. Yeah. And he, I told him like a year before, I said, do you want to come out and see me somewhere and we'll plan it now? And he goes, no, 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 too much bother. I won't. And then he contacts me about three weeks before he actually came. He goes, I was thinking there, maybe I go and see you. I said, you bollocks. And uh, I had to try and rejig a few things and meet him in Lima uh, because there's a big airport there. And the Dakar rally was starting on the 3rd or 4th of January. Mm. And I really wanted, uh, the plan was, that was one of my biggest highlights of the trip was to follow the Dakar rally for as many stages as I could. Do you know the Dakar? Mm. Yeah, it's huge. So anyway... My dad came out. Sorry, for anybody that doesn't know it, what is it? It's a race across the desert oh. with cool jeeps and bikes. Yeah. And Originally, it started in 1976 or something from Paris to Dakar and Senegal. because goes down across the Sahara and stuff. But there's a few categories. There's like an eight-ton truck. There's like your sort of a pickup truck. There's like side-by-sides, motorbikes and quads. and It's mental. Yeah. Like, I mean, no, they're the ones that you see YouTube videos where the body stays like this and the wheels are going like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's full on. And look, at, someday I'd like to just have a go at attempt, something like that. But anyway, so my dad um, is coming out and I, I'd been in Ecuador for like three weeks. And when I came in from Colombia into Ecuador, there was, there was a lot of trouble going on there. There was massive trouble in Venezuela and there was a mass exodus of people through Colombia um, Ecuador to Peru and Chile because there's better, better way of life or you can make more money in those countries than in say Colombia or Ecuador. But UNICEF, excuse me, UNICEF were at the border and it was like lots of asylum seekers and stuff and it was it was a bit chaotic. And I um, I thought I'd crossed all the T's and, the, and dotted the I's on all my paperwork and I, everything looked fine and my, my Spanish wasn't great. But so I, I was in Ecuador and when I went to leave, I stamped out my passport, no problem. Went to stamp out the temporary import on my motorcycle. And then the guy was like, hmm, problemo. Mm-hmm. I was like, huh? And he goes, hmm, it's not good. And he goes, your thing is expired. And then he says, $400. It was a 250i camera. I think it's $400 per day. And he said $400, fine. I said, ah, $400. That's a quite a lot of money like to me because I'm not earning anything. It's, you know, savings. And he goes, no, it's $400 a day. And it was like $2,700 or something I owed. And now I got a bit like, you're taking the piss here. Like, and I hadn't even got a chance to try and like, see, could we 
smooth things over with a few fifties or something. And next when two boys turn up with guns, like give me, give, give us the keys. And I was with an American at the time, Taylor, and he used to be in the military. And he's like, give him the fucking keys. <laughs> so I give him the keys. I was getting ticked. Like I wouldn't be a tick man now. I wouldn't. And I was like, you're taking the piss here. Man. My dad has already decided he's going to come out and I'm under a bit of pressure. So I have to give the keys. And we're talking and this is like $2,700 or something. And I said, like, what am I going to do? And I told Taylor to keep going. So I said, I have a spare key. I was, was kind of, I think I was joking. I don't know. I had a spare key and I said, Taylor, my password stamped out. We get on the bike and go for it. <laughs> and on the middle of the bridge is a big uh, sand bunker of, um, you know, guy with a, <laughs> well, not, I don't know about submachine gun, but with a gun. We're, for the story, we're going to say Uzi. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, I said, Taylor and Taylor, don't fucking do it. Taylor's going mad at me. He's young, he's younger, like he's younger book. And for an American, he's pretty sound. Get on well with him. Um, anyway, so I had to go into Peru because I'd stamped out. I had to spend an hour or two in Peru and then re-stamp back into Ecuador. And I was fairly thick now and, and I had to try and get a hotel. And it was a Friday evening, of course. So I'd spend two days waiting for Monday to appeal it. And that's a whole other story. And I'm going to go into it. It'll only annoy me. But in the end, I had to pay. Wow. Yeah. And that was not easy, but I had 2000 or over $2,000 on me, thankfully, because your bank account or your card will only let you take out 200 and it was a, it was a disaster, but I managed to get enough money and I, um, I got stamped out, whatever. And I got onto the bridge in Peru and I just literally took all the anger and frustration and I just left it still on that bridge. And I went to Peru I had the most amazing time. Peru is my favorite country. Just stunning. Has everything. Mountains, beaches, um, the culture. Did you go see, um, is it Machu Machu Picchu? Yeah, I did, yeah. What's that like? Really cool. Me and Taylor, there's a a back way up to it. Um, And we rode our bikes up as far as we could. And then you trek in about about 14k along the railway. And uh, yeah, we did it. Very cool. And you're sitting there thinking there's no way there wasn't another ancient civilization before us. Well, there was one before the, before, believe it or not, Machu Picchu, there's like, there's buildings up there that, uh, that, uh, that they think they built on the, top of. Yeah. 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 And I can see, you can see the difference in mm, the, the and, and, was, the, and the accuracy of the rock and stuff. So it's, it's the same in the, in Giza in, in Egypt. Yeah. That they were built on top of the uh, ancient yeah. buildings. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I got to question the whole thing, but look. It was a bit actually now that I think about it, it was overrated uh, because I actually went in the off season, but it was still busy. And me and Taylor, I found this place. Um, it's one of the Rainbow Mountains, but there was a, a Rainbow Mountain that everybody knew about, and then there was this other one that nobody knew about. And I'm, I don't know how I found it. When you say Rainbow Mountain is full of homosexuals, or if you're into that. Well, look, you know, I'm no. not gay, but 20 euros, 20 euro. <laughs> no, no, like it, it had different colors, like red, green, purple, um, yellow, like all these. Um, again, I, I'll i try and get a picture for you later or something. Hmm. But it was just, um, it's just stunning, right? And me and Taylor arrived. We were the only two there. And there was a guide, kind of a guide there waiting to bring us. And they had like a llama tied up, you know, you get a picture and all that. But Germán had, and the... The locals have these really colorful clothes and scarves and hats and they're just very beautiful. They're small people like, and uh, this guy brings us up and it starts snowing and then the snow, like it's a bit horrible, but we get up and the color is amazing and then the sun just comes out and you should see this. I put the drone up, got some cool footage. It'll be in one of my videos. So that was my, that was one of the big highlights. But look, and my dad, getting a, we hired a car, went down to the Andes. We had New Year's Eve together, a few beers and a pizza and chilled out and uh, his bag got lost. Actually, I'll back up. His bag got lost. And my dad was bringing me out a new helmet. So I went to the airport on the bike. And I'm waiting at the airport for fucking three hours. And he, my dad is, he's old, like, and he, I don't think he could sign into the airport Wi-Fi or he didn't really know. Hmm. And I couldn't contact him. And I, and I knew his flight had landed. I knew he was on it. So I wait and wait and wait. It was like half one in the morning. And then he comes out and he was ah, my fucking bag has been lost and I didn't know and I was waiting there forever and then I found out and he was at the back of the queue then and pissed off. So anyway, but he had my helmet, my new helmet and he only had like a backpack and I said to him, I was going to put him in an Uber like and just followed Uber to the hotel 
And I said, fuck it, sure. You put on, he's a slightly bigger head than me. So I gave him my worn helmet and I put on the new helmet and we headed off through Lima. And like, there's one of those really rough areas. So I bring him on the bike and I'm lane splitting. I'm flat out two o'clock at night, still busy. Like, and he loved it. And he loved it? Loved it. I thought and you were going to say, he got off the bike and go, this lad, no, I wanted a rare. Yeah, no, I expected that. And he absolutely loved it. I brought him a couple of times on the bike. So anyway, I had to wait for his bag and I messed up a few things, but it also added to the story. I'd been in the Irish pub and there's three Irish boys own a pub out there. One lad is, two lads from Wexford and one lad from Armagh. And they put, they put me in touch with an Australian guy who was racing the Dakar on a quad. And I was like, bingo, because I wanted to get like a paddock pass, to, you know, to get into the, to get in and see everything and, hmm. and whatever. And then, so I met him and then he goes, he rang me up, he goes, hey, you're around for a few days. Would you come to the port and drive my, t um, lead my, he had a media vehicle and he had his like his um, um, service truck. And I said, yeah, no problem. So we go out there and we're just chilling, just, just passing time, waiting for him to pass things out of the port and we get the vehicles. And I take lead because these are right-hand drives from Australia and it's left-hand drive. And I've been driving in the country for ages and the boys are just fresh enough to play. And so I lead, you know, get through the traffic and all the bullshit. And we're going through the, one of the worst, roughest places in Lima on the highway like it's quite open there's rubbish everywhere and it's we're in traffic and my dad had his phone up on the on the dash and i just kind of and his window was quite it was down a lot and i said jesus what's your phone doing there get it out of there and literally as he put his hand up he put the phone into, into the middle this lad ran across and he jumped across like he jumped kind of through two two lanes of traffic onto the side um the side runner i was still moving forward and the arm came in flailing around trying to grab the phone my dad just like like pushed back in the seat. I grabbed your man's arm and I just pulled him into the vehicle. <laughs> I learned, I started letting up the, the window. Oh, the squishing his yeah, arm? Yeah, yeah. Like squishing. something like a movie. Yeah. So, and then the traffic started to free up, right? I wanted to wait till it freed up. I had him jammed, like, and my old lad is just like, what the hell? <laughs> and uh, and then I just, oh, he let go, he pulled his arm out quite quick once I got going. But John, John was on the racing quad. That's the, the Aussie guy. He was actually on the quad behind and he was ready to jump off. Only thankfully I got going so I could put a bit of pressure on your man. So that was that was good crack. Did you get very wise to that kind of thing? I would be, yeah. But my phone fucking got robbed in <laughs> <laughs> at the Dakar. The first day of the Dakar with my dad, we were we got tickets from your man and we got in in behind everything. Like we were in the paddock and we were in around everything. Like it was so cool. And we were going from one area to another and you have to push through a mass of people through like this tiny little gate and there was people pushing everywhere. And I am totally, I'm very street aware. Now I had my GoPro in one pocket and my wallet and my phone in the other. And I had my hands latched to them. Like my phone was, my hand was holding the phone from outside. Like that's how oh. it was. And my dad was behind me watching my backpack. And I said, stick to me. And we're going, and there's this woman beside me, she, cleavage like big boobies and she kept like pushing and pushing into me like really like pushing her boobs up into me and I was like get the fuck away from me like and I kind of was like mm, this something's not right here and she kept that pushing and then somebody just rammed my old lad into me and I nearly headbutted the girl in front of me and I put I took my hand off and this is as quick as it was I lifted my hand put it on the back just to stop my head and then I put my hand back down my phone was gone that quick that quick professionals like and I, and I was like a bull then I looked at you know who to say you couldn't hardly move I just turned around and I just drove me old lad back out and I got his phone out real quick and I looked up um find my phone and they had it switched off yeah I'm on six was it your one with the tits was part of part of yeah, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah she was yeah. gonzo then no she but sure even if you search her she wouldn't have had the phone yeah. you know it's a distraction. It's but she wasn't even. I was onto her, and I was only someone rammed me all that into me, mm. and I nearly headbutt someone. So I had to put my hand up. Yeah. I and mean, well, you just go on. Then you just that's it. That's just part of it. Move on. Yeah, but it was a disaster because the Dakar was starting the next day. I had to bring my old lad to the airport in about three hours' time. I had no phone, and I I relied on my phone for navigation. Um, you know, for social media, mm. for everything, for planning, research, everything. So I grabbed his phone, somehow working on Roman, 
and uh, went to a phone shop, paid an extortion amount for another iPhone. I had to get an iPhone because the other one was all backed up, you know, it was mm. backed up. And uh, somehow got the phone some way working and then dropped into the airport and then followed the Dakar. It was one of my best experiences ever. And Taylor, the American, was with me and a crew of lads from Ecuador that I'd met and did a motorcycle rally with had come down. And I was leading, I don't know, seven or eight, nine lads. I don't know why I was leading them, but I was leading. And it was some crack. And then we picked up two Aussies. I'm still really good friends with them. Went to see them in Australia. They were on rental bikes. Yeah, we had some fucking time. Just wild, like. Just camping out, drinking and chasing the Dakar and up at all hours. And yeah, just mental. That's crazy. And when, when you don't, when you don't, I know I'm going back to the African one, but that's the one that I was watching. <laughs> yeah. So when you decided to do that one, um, you knew that was going to be nearly a year away. Two years. Two years. So almost two years. So yeah, look, the, the American trip came to an end. I came home. I knew I wanted another DR650. I left that bike behind and it actually didn't hurt me leaving it, but I left with two big check-in bags. Like I took a lot of parts off it and then just... So you scavenged it. I scavenged it and that bike has went into other bikes. So there's, you know, the way I said online, there's like forums and things. Lads have found mm -hmm. out there's a DR650 in Patagonia and they've, they've hit me up looking for parts and they've got parts to keep their bikes going. So anyway, I come home, I'm home for a few months. I go back to work and I'd been in touch with Suzuki Australia through a friend. He knew a woman working there. And I said it to her and I sent her a few videos and then they, she sold me a bike cost price. It's 4,000 euro, brand new bike. It was for nothing like it was. Mm. So I bought that and my cousin was getting married, the same guy that um, I originally went to Australia with and he was getting married in uh, Bali. So I went out to the wedding with a bag full of bike parts and barely any clothes for the wedding. And then I, f I went out to Australia then for a month, bought the bike and I... Another guy I'd met at this Dakar rally had said, if you ever come to Australia, you know, you can come stay or work on a bike at mine. And he promised me this, that and everything and didn't deliver much. I had to build a bike out in front of a, a tiny open kind of carport with a few bits. And I, t I anyway, bought this brand new bike, 30 kilometers on the clock, and I pulled the whole thing apart. I reinforced the frame because I learned from the first You bike. learn from what you need and what you don't yeah. need. So Suzuki have made the same bike from 96 to, 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 to this day, the very same bike. They haven't changed it. They've only changed a few weaknesses in it. So same bike. I like it because it's air cooled and it's, it's very simple to fix in very remote places. So anyway, I build the bike. This is 2019 now. And I do a trip up to Brisbane to break in the engine. I do like three or 4,000 K just to break the engine in and it's ready to rumble. I fly home. I need to work, make a few, few dollars. And uh, then I was due to fly out on the 1st of April, 2020 and COVID fucked me rightly over. I like everyone else. And then I obviously had to cancel the, the tickets or whatever. So that never happened. The bike stayed there for two or three years with a friend out in Canberra and, uh, almost got it shipped home and I was in a relationship going steady and, um, that, that came to an end. I tried getting it going back on track just didn't happen and then I just wasn't the head was like I just I needed to leave and um the bike was there and Australia opened on Feb sometime in February 22 the bike is your wicked temptress it is she's my number one lady <laughs> no um anyway so Australia opened up and I gave my boss 30 days notice I normally give him more he doesn't need it, but I, you know, I normally give enough notice. And I said, 30 days, I booked a flight, told me I had about three weeks before I left and he wasn't impressed because he thought I was done. And, uh, yeah, I flew to Australia. I spent a year in Australia. I did a lap around Australia and I called into a few farms on the way. So I worked on a, I just did a week on a 280,000 hectare farm, sheep farm. That's a lot of sheep. That's a lot of sheep. That's like a county. I don't know what it is. You need to do the math. But anyway, I, I continued. I called into the farm I used to work on sort of 10 years before that just to say hello. And I did a quick service on the bike. You know, I had all sorts of experiences along the way, good and bad. I had a couple of crashes and 
you know, a few things. But they said, that farm said, farmer said to me, would you come back and do harvest? And I was like, ah, it doesn't really work with my schedule or what I want to do. Because the plan was to do a bit of Australia, go to Darwin and then sh- and ship into the East Timor and then Indonesia and go all the way up through Malaysia, Thailand, India, Middle East home. That was my plan. So I continued the lap. I worked on another cattle station over in Kimber in um in um Queensland. And uh another cool experience. Made a few dollars to try and, you know, fund. Just keep things mm. ticking along. Try and leave the money at home and just use uh, that money. And then I went back across the middle of Australia, all dirt roads from from basically from Sydney to Perth, all dirt. Obviously there was some tarmac, but very little. And um I did three, two months, sort of two and a half months harvest. And then I jumped, put me and the bike on a plane to set to Cape Town. And I decided in with 30 days notice to, to when I flew that I was going to go to Africa instead of Asia. Just the way the, the climate and the timing was working, it was the wrong time to go to Asia because of wet season and things. And Africa was the wild one that was always hanging on me. You know, there was, an intrigue or the wilderness and the it's da- like everyone sees it as really dangerous and like kind of scary and not not necessarily South Africa but like to do what I did to go up the west coast and stuff so yeah at 30 days I had to start planning it and all I looked at was visas and um I did 30 I did 35,000 kilometers around Australia and I did 37 around Africa and I did a fair spin in Africa too so how many miles have you done on the bike uh, maybe 185 or 90,000. I see, I seen a real, um, a real size Atlas of Earth of the comparison of the countries. And when you look on the globe, Africa is actually looks really small on it. And in real life, it's oh, like, yeah, yeah, bigger than the US. Like. Did you know that from the most westerly point to the most easterly point of Africa is further than the most westerly point of Russia to the most easterly point? Whereas you look on a map, Russia is huge, mm. but it's actually 500 kilometers longer. Africa's wider than it is in Russia. How many hectares did you say that farm was? 280,000. This leash is 172,000. <laughs> is it fuck? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, you're the man now I want to ask. I'm very confused about this. So when you listen to people in America talking about Russia and, mm. you know, America to Moscow and like, where's it, where's it, where's the place in America that's up? No, Alaska mm. like Alaska is like 55 miles from Russia yeah technically so like they're right beside each other yeah but that's like from Alaska to two different worlds really I was I got to within maybe how did I get to I got to within maybe 100 maybe 200k of the Bering Sea in in Russia I didn't get quite to it but life in Russia and life in Alaska is very different. More money or just more wealth in Alaska. You know, they're just, I don't know, it's just different. But it's hard to imagine the rips each other, though. Yeah, but two different worlds. They don't interact, you know, there's no there's no real... There's a ship leaves Vladivostok, or probably goes to, to Canada, but maybe not to Alaska. Is Africa on another level different than everywhere else? Yeah, mass... mass um, what would you say? Poverty. Did it, what kind of, like, is it poverty life changing to look at? Yeah, for sure. It's definitely changed me. Um, the way I sum it up is, well, not so much on the poverty front, but the way life is. Um, in Africa, just a, every day, to, you know, every, what would you say? The average person has so much time. They don't really work. They don't do much. There's no work for them. But they have all the time in the world for the family. You know, they spend time together play games, talk, uh, harvest, you know, do whatever they have to do. They're su- su- subsistence farming or whatever you call it. Is it subsistence? Yeah. Um, but here in Ireland or in Europe or in Western worlds, we we spend all our time working for money. We have lots of money. We kind of have lots of money, we but no we have time. no time. We have no fucking time. None. Think about the time you spend running around, the time you spend all week at work. And for a lot of people, their kids are actually getting looked after from other people, maybe their grandparents or creches and whatever. Whereas in Africa, take a, take a, the mother of the house, she could have six kids. As soon as the kids are able to walk, 
they're off her back. So they have the kids go on the, on a woman's back. There's kind of like a shawl or like a just a, a cloth. Have you stayed and lived with these people? No, Africa is one of the places that I didn't really get invited into homes like I did in Asia and in the Americas and other places. But, you know, you take it all in every day, you see it, you you do meet people. And I didn't really stay with that many people. Like mostly mm, white people definitely opened the door to me a lot in Africa. When they see other white people, they try and like make sure you're okay and look after you. But Africa was just a bit different on that front where the locals didn't take me in as, free, as, e as freely as in every other place I've been. But you see, look, you take those women, right? They'll have an, a very young baby on their back. And if they'll probably have another like two or three year old beside them walking. And the rest of the kids, if they're old enough, they're probably out working and, and you know, hoeing the ground and picking the weeds and harvesting. Everyone is out doing, you know, they're working together. And you see on a Saturday, all the kids will be walking out of school with their little picks or their shovels and hoes. And they'll just be just all walking out of town to their plot to go on. Do they look happy? Yeah. Yeah, they do. They do look happy, but you know, I've met, I've seen very poor um, people: Mozambique, Angola, uh, the the Congos, Nigeria. Very poor. What's the hardest day you ever had in Africa? What was? Can you can you think of the lowest point that you had? Ah, fucking malaria! What I said to you earlier. That looked rough. Yeah, it wasn't due to people. You know, I had malaria, stuck in a hotel room by myself uh, for six, seven days. And you think you were going to die? Yeah, at one stage I thought, yeah, that's it now. Just, and I, I, the problem is, right, I had left the malaria zone and I was now in, um, I was in Mauritania and I was on my way to Morocco. And uh, these, I had malaria before in Tanzania and I'd copped the signs straight away. What are I, the signs? If you imagine your brain was swollen up and the pressure was pushing out on your eye sockets, um, temperature, headache, uh, you get weak, aches and pains. What else? Yeah, temperature and that. They just you just assume malaria or worse. So I picked that up straight away and I went to hospital and I had a I had a rough um, two or three days in a in a bit of a host, uh, kind of a hostel in Tanzania, but the hospital was good. Got me, you know, I had the medication and stuff, but that was one rough ordeal. Um, anyway, second time around, I, I had a few, only one or two symptoms. Didn't it wasn't malaria to me. I had the medication, but I didn't feel the need to take it. It's quite heavy on your liver and stuff. So I took a rest day and I was fine. Did a big day, five hundred or six hundred k, to get to the Moroccan border or the Western Sahara, but you can't actually. That's another issue. It's not recognised as Western Sahara. Morocco have claimed it. And I learned very quickly not to call it Western Sahara. You'd be in big trouble. You'd be getting more than a slap on the wrist. They just did not like it. So anyway, I made it into Morocco. I was getting sick at the border. I was in ribbons. And the other thing is, for anyone going to Morocco, don't bring a drone. I knew it was illegal. I have two drones, a broken one and a good one. And um, I had hidden the good drone in my sleeping bag, like I put it in the middle and kind of made it, you know, Soft. Why did they not want you? With you? They're just illegal. I don't know foreign media, different things. I don't know. They're just not. You have to declare it. So I was, I was dying now at the border, and the boys come and they ask, "Any drones?" I was like, "No, no." Now I was dying. I didn't really give a fuck about the drones. And then you go to this office and that office, and it goes on for a couple of hours. And then I get to the last gate, and I think I'm home free. And I drive into this shed, and the guy, the guy was parking your bike there. So I park it and he takes the paperwork and then he goes, okay, you wait outside. It's a big x-ray machine on track, on a, on a, mm. on a slide. I don't know what you call it. Tracks or whatever. And I said, okay, right. And I just, I just chanced. I, I went to push the bike out and he goes, no, no, no. The bike stays there. <laughs> I was like, oh, the, the sweat was literally coming now. Cause you're sick as well. Sick and I'm worried. So, cause I've officially told him no, no drones. So anyway, I go outside and I'm just sitting on the chair, dying, and I'm ready to just put my hands up for the cuffs. Like that's that's what I'm fully expecting. Your man comes out and he didn't look happy, like, and he just hands me the right, you can go, hands me the paper. Oh man. So anyway, I get on the bike. Now I'd use up as you leave a country, you've a lot to think about. Like, yeah, you need to get a SIM card going into a country, you need to use up all the cash from the other country. 
So I'd normally fill up the bike, but I only had enough cash to put maybe half a tank in. And I'd forgotten that. I had 80k to go to a decent hotel because I knew I was not right. And I made it 40k. I was just too weak to put petrol in the bike at the border. And I made it 40k and ran out of petrol. And I could have cried. I nearly I cried. bet you could have. I nearly cried on the side of the road. And it's now it's hot, like it's 37 or 8. No shelter, there's no trees, it's just in desert. And I was like, oh, for the love of God. And I passed out a van, thankfully. And I'd, I'd, I'd laid the bike over on site to try and get the fuel into, you know, right into one side to try and get her going. And she went for a bit and then she stopped again. I had this van pulled in and I waved them down and they were Moroccans and they didn't speak any English. And I had no, I didn't have much fight in me to try and, I didn't even think about putting it in the back of the van and they said they'd no fuel. So they pulled out and I was just like, oh, I don't know what I was going to do. So they instantly pulled back in. They pulled right in front of me again. And they jumped out and he said, uh, they signed, they would clear out the back and put me in it, in the back of the van. I was like, delight. So the three of us lifted the bike in. I straddled the back of the bike. I sat up on the bike and I held the brakes. And I'm in the back of the van here, like rolling around, trying to keep the bike upright and trying not to get sick in the van. And I was looking around, I was in the black dark. I turned my light on on my phone, trying to find something to get sick into while trying to hold the brakes and hold the bike upright. And, 40 minutes in the back of the van and the sun baking. Oh, jeez, that sounds like torture. Got to the fuel station. I was so happy. Oh, my God. And I went in and bought the boys a few cans of Coke and whatever and didn't want anything and they were delighted and we chatted for a bit and then I went to the hotel and that was that. Had a rest day. I was feeling all right. Next day I got up and I was like, I think I'm all right. I think I'll be grand. And I had a, I actually had a malaria test kit with me and I had medication and I didn't think the need to, I should have. Hindsight's great. And then I just, that evening, I just dropped off the, off the side of the world. I just went to ribbons and I had, thankfully I bought a few extra bottles of water and, and a, few, a few bottles of juice or something. You need to keep fluids like, so yeah, I had a few days of absolute misery, vomiting, never shit myself before till then. That's one of the questions yeah. I'll be asking at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first. Yeah, it was. That was one of the one of the toughest things I ever went through. Yeah, I think that's the toughest day I've had. I've I've been lucky enough, you know. I, you can have bad days, but I don't really take the good with the bad, you know. Well, someone that's into the stuff that you're into and that kind of hardcore things, bad days must be bad days. Yeah, well, they are. Like, um, you know, you could be on the side of the road with your engine gone to shit. That happened in South America and everything worked out. Two ladies came and picked me up. Is engine. that part of the adventure? It is. The unforeseen. And and if everything went right, everything went well, you'd have no stories. It'd be just easy. I relish a bit of hardship. Everyone, anyone that knows me, they'd, they'd know that. Like hardship, you'd find me in the middle of it because not that I wanted, like my old lad loves hardship and I don't, but I don't mind dealing with hardship. I can just, I can figure things out, fix it get on with it you know yeah I don't know I relish it I suppose do you like being busy yeah I do yeah yeah I've only went back to work now two weeks or two weeks ago and I, I was off for uh, since I came home I've just been burnt out floating around doing a few days helping a few lads and doing nothing I needed to do nothing just I slept for the first three weeks I must have spent 14 hours a day in the bed just yeah, so happy you were happy to be home this well time. I was I was happy to be home and I tell you to my own bed well there's quite a lot to be said for that sure I was camping and you know you'd be hmm. staying in this hotel and th this house and that and sure sometimes you'd be on the floor or on the worst mattresses you've ever seen and yeah but yeah I'm back into work we need a bit of routine now to to just keep me right a bit at the minute and it's an amazing it or anyone that's listening go on to his youtube matt will tell you it's beautiful and the the, the instagram pictures are amazing yeah I'm actually i'm really looking forward to it as you have it done in episodes and stuff i want to really want to check out like following the series of it because yeah. the shots are just fucking yeah. savage well look i'll say um there's kind of like i guess there's three seasons on youtube but the first season was like some numpty with a gopro attached to his helmet yeah. didn't know what he was doing learned a few lessons Second season was retrieving the bike from Mongolia home. I got some nice footage, but again, I didn't have the drone and stuff. And then when I went to Canada, I tried to go a bit more in. And this time around, the videos will be, whenever I decide to edit, I don't want anything to do with it for the minute, but I have a lot of footage there that needs to be edited. And Australia alone, wait till you see that. 
<laughs> the things I got to see and do over there were mind blowing. And then again, Africa, like the drone, the drone survived most of it. It broke, fell out of the sky in Nigeria and uh, I had a spare drone. So it saw me out um, back through, through the rest of West Africa. And I'm a div of putting up the drone where you're not meant to like, um, Portage prison. <laughs> oh, I know, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> it's a good money in that. <laughs> you're not allowed to. Yeah, even. I know, I know. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm a devil for like, for instance, in Mexico City, there's one of the, the third biggest pyramid in the world is just north of Mexico City. Did you mm. know that? Yeah. It's very cool. I, I went up, went up the side of it. Well, I don't know if it was that You one. got up the side of that? There's, there's two of them there. There's two big pyramids. I can't remember if I went up the biggest one, but you can walk to the top of it. But I parked up the bike about, you know, six blocks from it. And I put the drone up in this quite little housing state. <laughs> and I got some cool footage. Like, I'm a devil for... That's deadly. Like, I don't... I You know, it's like stealth line. You put it up and you just land it. And you, I'm so quick at stacking that, packing it away, and I'm gone. Like, but I got too confident. I was in Morocco, right? And I was being very careful where I flew the drone. There had to be no one around. And I got some nice footage. But there was this old, like, it looked like a Roman ruin in north, northern Morocco. It looked very cool. Maybe it's from the Spanish or something. Like massive columns. Like something you would have seen in like Gladiator or something. Yeah. Like it was just special. Like Zeus's temple. Yeah. Yeah. There was a load of buildings. I could only get such a photo from, from my phone like on the ground. And I drove up a bit and there was nowhere really to hide. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I got a chance there. And I put it up and I got, I was getting some footage. And next minute this fucking, that's, that's it, came down. And two boys jump out and I, I'd like shimmy down the controller beside the bike and they were like pure angry and I go are you flying a drone <laughs> and I was like I had my hands, I had my hands <laughs> down hiding the controller and I was like oh my god there's no getting away and I just went I just like honesty is your best policy I do believe that and normally when you come clean things will be fine if you try and hide it very hard to hide it. No, I know, I know. But I was hiding it for, for, for 30 seconds. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I had to come clean and, geez, they weren't happy. And he says, the authorities have been called. Now, these boys were fairly, they were like the, the caretakers or the overseers of this, this place. So I flew the drone back, sports mode, and I grabbed it. And he goes, delete, you better delete all that stuff. And I happily, I deleted everything. Because the night before, I had downloaded everything from Morocco. So for, you didn't mind? Because I was getting close to leaving Morocco. So I just deleted what I had took. Yeah. Anyway, that was a close one. I got on the bike, right? And I just drove up the road like a lunatic because I thought the tires were coming. And then there was a bloody fucking checkpoint, like a kilometer up the road. And I panicked and I hit the brakes that hard. <laughs> the back kicked out. I locked up the back tire and the back kicked These out. These guys looked like you were a fucking yeah. lunatic. Come yeah. like. And they didn't even stop me. <laughs> I just, I scratched my head and I just had to go and pull in and calm down after that. But when, when you were, you meet so many people. And I think when you meet so many people and you get little snippets of, loads of people's lives it, it, they, everyone changes you a little mm -hmm. you, you change a little as a person yeah you know but what, what would you think you've learned the most from meeting so many people well I know for one thing that about 99 point I don't know 99.9% .9 of people are good or better than good in this world they are everyone is it doesn't matter if it's in uh, third or first world countries um, we just want a roof over our heads bit of food and to look after our family and there's not that many arseholes out there I've met very few on all of my travels and for someone like me who puts herself out there into wild places and re very remote places in the world um I've never had any issue I've never been robbed I expected to be at, held at gunpoint at least once in Africa not once not a thing was robbed in Africa but I don't know, I've, I just, I think people are, people can be, ama can be amazing, but we can be, uh, I don't know, we're, uh, we can be pretty shit towards each other as well. Like you look at this, look at the state of the world at the minute, there's no need for all the, the conflict and violence that's going on, but you're, it's, it's either religion or land-based or whatever, you know. Hmm. Yeah, I'd look for me, I just want a simple life now, I, I don't, um. What do you I call a simple life? Well, I don't need much. Like I, um, I'd like to meet a woman, and as I said back to, uh, before we started recording, um, 
I don't really have much planned ahead traveling wise. I'm, I'm full. I'm fulfilled. I've seen everything that I've sort of ever wanted to. There's a little bit overhanging. Like I'd like to go to Antarctica because I didn't finish out my trip in, in Argentina, but a few other countries. But I, uh, I just want a small house, a bit of land, a few animals. Simple enough life. I don't in Ireland. Yeah, I think in Ireland. I love Ireland, but I tell you right. I spent nearly two years on the road and I nearly had blue skies every single day for two years, right? It rained. Well, when I was riding the bike, it rained about eight days on the whole trip for me. And I've had blue skies and I've got home to Ireland now, a few months. And I think yesterday there was a blue sky and one other day. The weather has, uh, I don't know why it's so bad, but I didn't, I didn't remember it as bad as this. But at the same time, I've been away a lot and I've come back. No matter how bad we say the weather is in Ireland, it's not that bad because I've done the plus 40 degrees in Australia. I've done minus 30 in Canada. I've done the extremes. The weather here isn't so bad. But Ireland is home. The Irish people, we look, obviously we get each other. And I've lived in Canada. Canadians are too nice and they're a bit dry and they don't get humor. They annoyed me, actually. They're just too nice. I'd like to, you know, so a bit of sarcasm, a bit of banter, mm. a bit of bu- abuse. Yeah. That's the way That's it is. the Irish way. Yeah. Australia the same. Aussies are a bit, a bit obnoxious, lazy. I wouldn't live in Australia. New Zealand. I really love New Zealand. It's the, it's the other places. Yeah, I would. I'd probably move to New Zealand. But no, simple enough um, house. Don't want much. I'd like to meet someone that's similar, like-minded, adventurous. And uh, yeah, we'll just see what happens. Do you get on better with your family now after all that? Ah, yeah. Yeah, but I was, even before I left, um, me and my dad get on very well now. But we don't really, we we're better off not working together. I think most families are like that. I know, my brother gets on all right, because my brother is, he took on the farm and my dad is, he loves the farm, he wants to die on the farm. And uh, he's, he, he taps away, you know, doing little bits every day. Did but your brother ever travel? He did. He, he did two years in Australia. And when I went to New Zealand... He, follow, he came from Australia to New Zealand and the North Island wasn't big enough for the two of us, so he went to the South. But yeah, I hung out with him for a month after I finished the rugby and explored the South Island. But, um, and then he came home and then when, it, when we both came home, we used to have about 250 sheep. And because the two of us had left our old lad in the lurch, he, um, we came home, we didn't even know, sheep were gone. Go away. Yeah, we were fucking delighted. Sheep are bastards. There's some work. There's some work. Oh, them. man. Like, no sleep whatsoever when they're in the end. Yeah. And what did the farm now? Uh, beef, yeah, cows. Well, we always had cows and, and, and calves, but we used to do, you know, suckler and mm. um, and that, but too much work and, like, we'd buy in an extra, you know, you put two calves per cow and the rest, but, but now it's just... It's a bit more straightforward, but yeah. So I think he's he's rearing a few calves as well. Um, you know, he buy them off, off a few dairy farms and that, and bucket feed them or whatever you want to say. Did you? What's the weirdest thing that you've seen on your travels? What's the weirdest shit you've seen? <laughs> what is the weirdest? I don't know. Has an animal ever tried to attack you? Oh god, yeah. He don't say oh god yeah and not tell me <laughs> I, I did see a black bear on the yeah. on the footage from Canada there <laughs> the black bear that was my first uh, I was, uh, into my second week in Canada and I knew black bears I'd done a lot of research on bears and snakes so snakes for Australia and spiders and then before I leave before I go somewhere I would try and do a bit of research on animals because I, I wild camp I put myself out there like I just I, I'll just call home anywhere anyway the black bear was, I didn't realize black bears were as small as they are and uh, until they stand up, of course. But when they're on all fours, they look quite small and this guy looked friendly. <laughs> 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 and I got off the bike and he circled me, the fucker. And I had bear spray now. I had bear spray. That's the thing. Huh? Oh God, yeah. Bear spray is like amped up uh, pepper spray. Like for humans, only it's amped up like, and it's it's probably a, more of a pressurized can. It'll, it 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 squirts it out about two meters and then it kind of goes into like a cloud and then the bear like runs into it and it'll work like 98% of the time. Whereas if, if I had a handgun right and you're a bear running at me and I I put, you know, three or four slugs in you, but I don't kill you, now you're angry as fuck and you are going to destroy me. 
So the bear spray, once they walk into it, it gets in their eyes and their nose and they have a really sensitive nose. They just turn around and run. I don't recall. Go <laughs> Do you want to see it? Yeah, show me. <laughs> show me the pepper spray. <laughs> Still recording here. In a demo. Yes. How you going, buddy? <laughs> How's it going, like? <laughs> I spent about uh, 15 minutes with him. Good luck. I shot myself. <laughs> nah, he's grand. The big, big browns. And then you shit yourself. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, did you ever get bit by a snake? No. In in South Africa. Two Cape Cobras, which are highly poisonous. Um, so they, they'd be on the road and they uh, they stood up like, well, they, yeah, I don't know what you say, stood up. They stood up about sort of tie level and went for me while riding a bike. And I was riding really fast, which was a scary thing. Like, which was funny. Well, it's kind of funny and scary at the same time. No, no, just scary. <laughs> well, look, I've got motorbike boots that are up to nearly bottom my knee. And then I'd have motorcycle pants, which would be thicker than jeans, you know. They'd be a bit padded. So I was never really worried. Fucking hell. Spiders. Um, I took off my helmet in Morocco, right? I was staying with this mad Irish lad from Port Leash. Have you ever heard of One Eye on the World? Gary. Um, One Eye on the World? Gary. You're a Port Leash man. Gary O'Keefe. Yeah. Uh, you must have heard of him. Yeah, that lad, you need to get him in here. Anyway, he is fucking mad. Anyway, I, I met this lad. That's another story, but I met him and his crew out in, there's a few lads from, from out, from here, from Abbey Leaks out in the, out in the Sahara, out in Morocco. Fucking mad. We were having the crack and I ended up staying in a hotel with the boys and I put on my helmet the next day. We went out to the sand dunes and um, I took off my helmet to talk to Gary 40, about four or five minutes after I put it on. And as I took it off, this huge spider, okay. like came, he was on top of me. I don't know how I didn't squish him or he didn't bite me. He's on top of my head and he just rolled, as I took the helmet off, he rolled out down my nose. Oh, for fuck's sake. I nearly got sick. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I hate fucking spiders. Oh. There's no need for that many legs or eyes. So Gary's got 11 more countries on you. Has he? <laughs> yeah. 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 Gary wants to get, he wants to be the first Irish man to get to every country. Mm. This lad is, um, he's called One Eye on the World. Yeah, definitely. I definitely know him looking at him here. Yeah. He's... He's a he's a madman. They set a Guinness World Record for driving the longest stretch over a um a frozen lake, which is in Lake Baikal in Siberia, just at the start of COVID. Look him up anyway, we'll talk about him later. He is Jesus Christ, that's mad. He is something else. Are you ready for some questions? Sure. Right. What's your first vivid childhood memory? I don't know. I, what comes to mind is um a picnic on the side of Mount Leinster. Um, I think just before, I must have been about three or so. My mum, dad and my older brother and sister. And it was, we had this old two stove, two ring, you know, those gas cookers. Yeah. I remember this old one with the orange. And Frying that. a few sausages. Sausages, yeah. It was a barbecue sauce. Yeah. Sausages and it was paragliders going off the side of the mountain. Really? Yeah. They still do it, but yeah, I remember that. It's very clearly. Did you ever paraglide? Yeah. I did once, broke my tailbone. Did you fuck? Yeah. First time, uh, Vicky told me not to go. And I, met, I said, no, no, I have to go, I have to go, I broke my tailbone. Uh, would you like yourself if you met yourself? I was waiting for this. No. Why? I'd have to take a bit of time to get to know me, I think. I don't know. I think I'm the kind of person that, like, I don't like negative people. If, I, if, I, if, if anyone... Um, How do you define negative? You know, people that fucking draw energy out of you. Leave you flat afterwards. I don't have any of those people in my life because it's, it's no good. But, like, I don't take any shite. I'm fairly straight cut or straight shooter. And, I don't know. Just I am who I am. And I guess maybe it might take people a bit to war. I don't know. But if I met myself, yeah, I'm not sure. It might take a few days. Let's <laughs> go. Cool. Who brings you the most happiness in your life? Well, like, I do know about this one as well. Like, I have a nephew now, first, first uh, new blood in the family. He's he's just amazing, Oliver. But 
for the last two years, I guess I've been bringing my own happiness because I've been by myself. I've been away from everyone. You know, I've, I've had what, geez, what a trip I've had. So I don't know what the right answer is to that. But I look at home. I love, I love seeing my dad happy when he's not happy. He's a fucking, <laughs> he gets great, gets grumpy and, but he's happy out. And I just want to see him happy because, you know, they're not going to be around forever. You know that. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Family, friends. On your, on your normal every day. What's your favorite part of the day? <laughs> I'm trying to readjust the normal life here, so I don't know what to say to you. Um, it has to be actually really just, hard to readjust to a normal life when you have that adventure from the time you wake up in the morning yeah. to the time you go to bed. Like that's a high adrenaline. You're switched on all every day. day. Yeah. Well, look, I guess it'd be the same as running your own business because. You never stop thinking. You're like, where am I going to get food, fuel, accommodation? What am I going to see? Where do I get money? Where do I get a SIM card? Uh, do I I probably get caught by the cops for Sweden? I'll sort that shit out. I have a breakdown. Whatever. There's Every day is is endless. Like, yeah. Does it make everything now there? No. No, I'm I'm still adjusting and trying to process. And I'll tell you what will help me process that is when I start editing videos. That will actually... I'll be processing and because right now it feels like a dream. It doesn't mm. feel real. All the stuff I've done just feels like a dream. Yeah. Uh, I, it's mad. It's a mad. <laughs> is home, this is it now. I, I, I can't wait to ask you this one now because I ask a lot of people this question, but it's different when you're asking different people. Mm -hmm. Is home for you a place for feeling? Two things. Home, home is where I was born and raised. Like it's, but. When I'm traveling, home is where I put my head down. It's just a feeling like it's, it could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. Like if I stayed in a place for two days, I could be in town and be like, right, should we go home now? Like I wouldn't call it, you know, the hotel or the b, &B. It'd be just home. Home is wherever I put my head down. So when you set your camp up, middle of nowhere. That's home. That's my home. The bike is my home when I'm on the road. Realistically, the bike is my home because it has my, all my camping gear. Got a little stove, a pot. It's got spare parts for the bike, tools. I do all the maintenance and the work. Um, drone, camera, clothes. Um, just self-sufficient. Has everything, and it. it's like a donkey shirt. It fucking carries everything for me, like. And I drive the shy out. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> when you're camping out and you're looking at the night sky. Yeah. Oh. And you're in remote places like you've been, yeah. and you're really getting to see, you know, yeah. not just the stars, the galaxies oh, and yeah. the. The stuff, like you've seen, I've seen some pictures you put up. It's like, do you think that when humans lived like that years ago, it made them, that's what made people more spiritual or believe in a higher thing or what, what, what way do you think that works? Yeah, I think so. Um, like I'm not religious, but I'd be more of a pagan, I'd say, if anything. But like I religiously look at the sun in the sky every day where the sun is like in, at home, I can tell you, I like, even if, if I didn't know what time of year it was, miraculously, I didn't know. And I saw the sun, I could tell you. I just know every day I can see it. It goes from, you know, from winter to summer where it is. But this, yeah, the sky is, I don't know, they're in, enthralling, like, mm. at night. I'll, I, I love camping out, especially in more remote places where there's no light pollution. And if I can get a bit of firewood, light a fire, and uh, a bottle of wine and just I've this, this little camping chair and it just about that angle and I just yeah have you seen the Aurora Borealis I have yeah yeah, yeah I've seen it about 10 times now <laughs> well I lived in Canada mm. that is special yeah I've even seen it have you ever heard of a sun dog no what's that <sighs> a sun dog is basically um it happens in colder climates but say there's milder weather like um and then there's a cold snap and there's like moisture in the air and the cold snap comes and the moisture turns to like, to I have seen that. crystals or, yeah. or like icicles. But then, so your sun is there and there's two half suns. You'll have to get a picture of that. There's two half suns and then there's like, um, like a rainbow ring, not rainbow, but it's like a very thin, shiny ring around it. And you look at the sun and you think, what the fuck? I was in Canada. What was it called again? Sorry. Um, a sun dog. Sun dog. That's the like, I don't know. It's not the right name, but that's what everyone knows it as. Mm. But I was, I was ogring out of a big meal bin and I look up at the sun. I was like, what is going on? And I got on the two way. I was like, lads, 
what's wrong with the sun? I didn't know what. And they're like, just started laughing at me. It's like, that's a sun dog, Irish. This is? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That looks savage. Imagine not just never known of such a thing, right? And you look up at the sun. <laughs> yeah. God's come for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I thought God. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if you walked into a room with everyone you've ever knew, who would you go to first? My mommy. What would you say to her? I don't know. Never thought about that. I just see how she is and I don't know. I am just talk and talk and talk. Tell her everything. You the youngest? No, younger sister. Do you ever feel close to her when you were on your... She's definitely looking after me. Someone's looking after me because if I was a cat now, I'd be on my third set. <laughs> <laughs> third set lives. Yeah, I would. I'm not joking. I, look, I told you I'd push it. I've had many close ones. Too close. I do respect my life, and the older I get, the more I respect it. But um, yeah, I think someone there's something looking after me. There's there's something out there. I don't know. Maybe I'm the luckiest man alive, but I uh, I've definitely pushed the limits. We're all very lucky to be alive. We are. I tell you, if you if you take the what is the chance of you actually even making been born? It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Us being here today. Like each one of us even taking our first breath, mm. we're after winning a, a lottery oh, yeah. with huge odds. Yeah, yeah. And, and the problem is, right, not that everyone needs to, but we don't live a full enough, most people don't live a full enough life. They're just, they're just, they're just surviving. They're just existing. Mm. existing, yeah. I'm okay with existing now for the next few months because I just, I'm coming down off of a huge yeah. trip, but I'm very happy to do fuck all. But I'll get back in. I need to set a few goals and, and figure out what's next. I love that saying that every man lives two lives and he only lives his real one when he realizes he only has one. Yeah. Life, look, and again, from my mother and from Kelly getting killed, I learned that life is short. So that's why I just grabbed it like by this scruff. I only started living when I was really 20 or a bit older. I only really started living. The rest of it was just like, you know, it's just, it just school. It was just... Going through the motions. Motions, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Do you believe in God? No, I don't. My dad won't like hearing that, but we've, we've kind of had that conversation. My dad has tried to guilt me into going to church, like he's done, done so for years and years. And uh, no, I don't. What's the most painful thing you've ever been told? Um, I was in Poland at a christening for one of my mates. Um, he had a Polish missus and it was the night that uh, Kelly got killed in the, in the car crash. My cousin rang me. And he didn't exactly tell me in a night. I don't know. He just, it was fucking, it was tough to hear. Yeah. Nothing ever topped that, I think. The shock. Yeah. And being away, not being mm. there. Yeah. Uh, how do you define success? <sighs> I don't know. Um, success, just, I don't know. You got to set goals, get a good routine. I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is to that. Would you think you're a high achiever? Yes and no. <laughs> it depends. Yeah, sure. If I want something like and I aim high, like all these trips, these haven't been easy. I've had to um, sacrifice things to go away, you know, should have had a house and this and that. And, but if you have a goal and you want to go for it, yeah, I think just go. What's the most important thing you've learned from all your travels so far? I don't think you're finished yet for some reason. No, well, I don't know. <clears throat> just be grateful. We, we're not grateful for it. Let's just take Ireland. We have it so well here. We've great food. Look, we have a health system of sorts. You go to Africa, they have no health system. In most parts in Africa, people go to pharmacies or witch doctors and they say you should take this and they take the wrong medicine. 
the average age in say Zambia is geez, it's like twenty something. Really? I don't know. I know it's it's and the people are tiny even for from malnutrition or malnourished. Um in these things. But here in Ireland again, I just I'm so grateful to what I'm so fortunate what I was born into. I was born into just even just a Western country, or be it Ireland. Like everyone goes on about the weather, the roads, the 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 government. Sure, the governments are all useless. It doesn't matter which country you're in. It's all the same, you know. But just be grateful. Like we have something special here, and people don't just take it for granted. If I could give you your perfect life in ten years, what does it look like? I don't know. Probably. Working three days a week <laughs> for myself. Um, Mrs. Maybe a chap, a few animals, a bit of land. I don't know, something like that. That's yeah. I, I'm I'm going that way more. I'm as I said. I'm pretty much um, fulfilled on the traveling front. I think yeah, I do. I, look, I'm not saying I won't go away again. It could be like two or three weeks here or there. Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but I, I am at that stage. Like I've done all these trips solo and I've met, I've met other travelers along the way, but I want to, I want to share it now. I want to meet someone and share it, you know. I think everyone wants that. Yeah. I know it's not that I haven't, like I have, I have been kind of looking and along the way and I've met lovely girls and women around, around the world, but maybe it's timing and different things and the kind of people that would join you and come and you'd be willing to, to bring just timing and different things. What age are you? How old do I look? Don't insult me now. I don't know. Are you 30? <laughs> She's like, yeah, fuck off. I'm 35. Know, are you 35? Mm. You're not that. I'm fucking way older than you. I'm 43. Me. Yeah. 44 this year, actually. Yeah, I won't say. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I should look. The other thing is the, the stigma or the, the societal expectation, you know, by the time I'm my age, I should have had this, that, and everything else, you know, but I don't really... I put a bit of pressure on myself when I was leaving Australia. I need to get home a bit sooner before I get, you know, too old and meet someone and blah, blah, blah. But then in Africa, I chilled out a bit and I started to realize, you know, it'll be all right. But the pe the people that went and done the having a house by 35, having a family, having a whatever, will never experience the things you've experienced. Like it's one or the other. Yeah, kinda. yeah absolutely. And uh, I have no regrets. I spent... Jeez, lads, I tell you what, I would have had some mention or mansion by now if I was to build a house or to buy a house with what money I spent traveling. But no regrets. I'd do it all again. Every bit of it. The experience is unreal. The like I love the landscapes and nature and the vastness. I do like like remote places, deserts and like Australia is fabulous. And then, you know, I'll go into a city for a few days, get a few parts, catch up, meet a few people, and then fuck off back out. I'd sooner be out in the more remote areas. I think it's crazy if uh, if you went out on a random night in Wexford and you met you, and there's no one could anticipate the story that you could tell him. Yeah, maybe. No, no, there's no, there's no maybe about it. That's a hundred percent true. Yeah, but look, and I've learned this as well. Um, since I've like not this time, but all of my trips, you come home, you see your friends, you see a few people, and you have a chat. And most of your closer friends, you'll have a chat once or twice and then it's put to bed. They, they're living their lives. You have to, under, you, I understand that. Mm. I went off and lived this fucking crazy, magnificent life for myself because it's what I wanted. But then you kind of, there's part of you thinks, you know, maybe they'll ask more questions or they'll want to know and you'll want to share because you want to share because you haven't actually, say, done it with someone to share, but they don't. But I already know that now. I've been away and back enough times to know. They'll ask you once. But then you'll meet the odd person in the pub that'll fucking hound you every Friday to see you. And what about this and that? And that's great. I have no, I'll have no. i tell stories, but I have to listen to my friends. Ah, oh, fucking trip, 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 trip. <laughs> my friends are fucking cunts. <laughs> you, wait, do, do you think um, these are just random questions now, right? Yeah. Like, tell me, fuck up, whatever. Do you think life is a simulation? What do you think of that theory? You, yeah. Well, the way, the way they manipulate and, and manage people and the school system and things, yeah, it can be a simulation. Yeah. 
it just repeats, you know, you die, next person comes in. I don't know. I know I can think for myself and I can do what I, what I think I want. I'm not one of the sheep. There's too many people, but sure, like without the sheep, there's a lot of fucking chaos. There's not, who's going to be doing, who's working in the restaurant, who's cleaning, who's changing your sheets in the hotel. I'm not saying they're sheep. I'm just saying everyone is doing their part. Look, at when I'm here, I'm a diver. I'm keeping the piers and the ships afloat. And I'm doing that, which is keeping the cycle going too. But I can step outside it and go and do my thing. And in the future, I want to go and do my own thing. I want to be my own boss and I have a few bits to figure out. But yeah, you see, I couldn't set something up for myself and then just decide I'm going to go away for the next two years and try and come back and, you know, everything's gone to, gone to shit. But now I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to stick around. If there's someone like you that's planning and wants to and is putting off a trip, not mm. maybe as hardcore as the ones that you've done, yeah. what would you say to him? Well, the first thing is, um, if you're anyway serious and you're, you've started planning, book the ticket, the flight ticket or the ferry ticket. That's the first thing you do. And it could be for a year's time, but you book it, just book it. And then the other thing that I, know I like to do is if, if there's about a year, I set a countdown timer on my phone, like, a, you know, to the year. Mm. And every now and then you have a little look and you go, Jesus, 200 days, 140 days. And then 30 days, you're like, <gasps> get your shit together. Yeah. But book the ticket, right? And you have something to work to. Because everyone talks the talk. They talk, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And I've got the bike now. I'm getting the gear. And then... They make an excuse or something happened and they can still do it, but they keep looking for excuses. They're not, a lot of people, look, what I did is not for many. There's not many people in the world will do what I do and because solo, you're out there by yourself. Sometimes, a lot of times there's no one out there to pick you up or to do anything. You're on your own and it takes a certain mentality, but yeah, I don't know. Some of the cleverest clinical psychologists in the world said that if men can't spend time on their own and get to know themselves, that they become very dangerous and realistic. Mm. A French philosopher said, I can't, French Pascal, I think, he said that man's greatest problems come from not being able to sit in a room on his own and do nothing. Wow. I don't know, but yeah, I couldn't sit and do nothing. Like I would need to do something, but I have no problem being by myself. And like you think about the time I spend uh, in my helmet on the motorbike. And it's just, you get to process, you get to think about things, mm. turn on the music, turn on to some fucking Dave Cuddy podcast and zone out for half an hour. Listen to I don't album. know. I wouldn't be able to survive if I couldn't zone out. I spend a lot of time on my own in the machine. I'm not traveling, but I no, spend I a lot of time on my yeah. own, yeah. in my own head. What do you do to, do you play music? Do you just be sometimes in your head? Sometimes I play music. Most, sometimes I, I, there's definitely two, three hours a day I'm just thinking. Yeah. Is that too long? No, I like it. Yeah. And my favorite part of the day is red early in the morning. Red early in the morning. No, I have a lot of kids. Right? Say that so again? Red early in the morning. Yeah. My favorite part of the day is when I get up early, mm-hmm. no kids up. Yeah. Like he's not up. It's yeah. quiet. Just no, no sound. Just think, yeah. thinking. And back to you asked me that earlier. It is first thing in the morning when I get up. Yeah. If you, what advice would you give to any young lad that is struggling like you were back in Australia, when you were at your darkest? Look, for me, one of my friends suggested that I go see someone and, you know, maybe get some antidepressants or something. But that's, I'm 100% against that. Because all you're doing is numbing something. You're not, you're not fixing it, I think. And it just, it's a cycle as well. You're, you're, you know, I've never been on any anything like that. And as I said, I don't really like talking to people. But sharing the story, like... I will openly talk to people about, people ask me like what motivated me to do all this and I'll tell them about the loss in my life and different things and I'll be open and the more you talk about it, it definitely gets easier. But I would say you need to find a passion, like when you're in a hole like that, it's like an addict, you can only do so much, they have to help themselves to, to, to come out of it. I helped, I pulled myself out, I did. And it was a motorbike and it was travel, the, this dream and this goal. Look, it's not easy to see because you're in a black cloud, 
And thankfully, like I've now I know the signs. And if I if I ever feel it coming on, I acknowledge it straight away and I'll say, okay, well, let's do something or, you know, figure out something. I can see it. So I would just say you have to find something that you're passionate about, something that you that you just have a grow for, you know. And then just go all in or concentrate your your mind onto that. That's what I would say. Ian, I have to say, thanks. It was so interesting. And I'm so glad you came on because when I, I asked you to come on ages ago. Mm. And um, look, I, 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 I ask people that I think are interesting to come on. If they don't want to come on, they don't want to come on. But yeah. it's just an amazing story. We'll just pop the links and you should go look yeah. at it because it's, it's, the match. it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm. And like your photography, I genuinely thought you threw me a curveball with the diving and stuff because I thought you were a photographer or something. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely thought you were a videographer yeah. or something because no. it's, it's really cool. Yeah. But um, thanks a million for coming on. No, really thanks. appreciate it. Yeah. No, look, thanks a million for having me. Just on the Instagram, yeah. if anyone doesn't want to follow me, um, if you want to look back through my trips, go through, do you know the way there's a story highlight on yeah. top of your... Highlights, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, if you go back and even for the last trip, go to Australia and just flick through it and it'll really give you like a very quick taste of of what what was like. Because I, I didn't actually brush on this earlier. When when you travel solo, right, and it's, it's, I fucking, I take it all in. Like I could tell you every single day of all of my trips. It's just like a sponge. But... I like to share things on Instagram because one, it might motivate people and it, it'll take people to corners of countries or, or continents that no one will, you know, ever get to and I get to, to see it. But by sharing it, I'm putting it out there. And then when I come home, you know, there's, I can have a, a bit of a chat with someone that, cause they've said, no, oh, I saw you were in fucking mm. Tanzania and blah, blah, blah. Mm. Yeah. It's just, and when I when I started the last trip, I didn't have any want to, to to put much up on Instagram, and I slowly got into it, and then I quite enjoyed it. Because then sometimes you're out camping, and you're, you know, end of the day, you've a bit of time to throw up mm. a few bits and edit a few bits, and then I quite enjoyed it. But at the minute, I've stepped back from Instagram. I've still lots of pictures to post, but I'm just on a break. <laughs> yeah. I have no fucking cool content like that to put on. <laughs> Not Same thing right. every day. <laughs> Forestry. <laughs> Trees. <laughs> Machines. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Thanks yeah. a million. No, cheers. Really cheers. appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks a million. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, remember, if you want to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash the wood from the trees. And uh, yeah, I'll see you again next week.